meeting to order. I am inviting everyone to join in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? With pleasure, Madam Deputy Mayor. Councilmember Hedges. Here. Councilmember Lorraine. Here. Councilmember Newsom. Here. Deputy Mayor Diaz Nash. Here. And Mayor Lee is absent representing the city in Toyonaka, Japan for the 60th anniversary. Thank you. We are excited to be here in person with options for those who choose not to be in person to participate virtually. There are several ways to participate. For those attending in person, please com complete a yellow request to speak slip and hand it to the clerk. If you are participating remotely, please use raise the hand feature in Zoom and you will be called on at the appropriate time. If calling in via phone, please press star nine to raise your hand and when called upon, please press star six to unmute. These options for public comment will remain available until I close the public comment period for each specific item. Our first item on the agenda is ceremonial. It is Breast Cancer Awareness Month and issuing a proclamation. And we have San Mateo's police chief, Ed Barbarini, to come down and, and receive the proclamation. Thank you so much. Whereas October is National Breast Cancer Awareness Month, which is an annual campaign to increase awareness of this disease, and whereas National Breast Cancer Awareness Month remains dedicated to increasing public knowledge about the importance of early detection of breast cancer diagnosis and treatment, and whereas the American Cancer Society estimates in the United States more than 297,000 new cases of breast cancer will be diagnosed this year, and over 43,000 people will die. And whereas increased breast cancer screening increases early detection, reduces death, increases life expectancy, decreases late stage cancer diagnoses, and increases five year survival rates. And whereas organizations such as the American Cancer Society, Susan G. Komen for the Cure, and our very own San Mateo Police Department and Police Officers Association have held community events this month to promote awareness, conduct screenings, raise funds for research, and educate the community about the importance of early detection. And whereas the city of San Mateo supports breast cancer research and wishes to educate residents about detection, risk factors, and treatment, and encourages our city to go pink in October to raise awareness, promote early screening, and honor those affected by breast cancer. Now, therefore, be it resolved, I, Deputy Mayor Lisa Diaz-Nash of the city of San Mateo, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim October 2023 as Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And Chief, would you like to say a few words? Thank you very much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. And thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor and the Council, for taking the time to recognize this month. As you see, I am wearing pink patches. Uh, the, uh, m many of our officers are doing the same. Our police, uh, many of our police ca cars have pink patches on their doors this month. So. Please take a look. Um, breast cancer is an issue that's near and dear to our hearts at the police department. And we've kind of taken a lead in the county in um, uh, jumping this month off and getting it started with a, uh, an event that we'd like to invite everyone to on uh, this Saturday the 7th down at the pedestrian mall on the 200 block of B Street. 
will be our kickoff uh, pink patch party. Uh, so we invite everyone to come down from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. We'll have all kinds of activities, including live music. Um, I will be in a dunk tank for a period of that day, so it's uh, it's uh, 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 an opportunity to to dunk me and other police officers, uh, which many people seem to enjoy for some reason. Um, so we we invite you. There is a donut eating competition as well, which I'm going to try to get out of, but we'll see how that goes. Um, but more importantly, in all seriousness, it is to raise awareness for a, a very worthy cause. We will have a, a mobile mammogram uh, vehicle um, out there for those who are interested in that service. And uh, we thank you, we thank um, the council for giving us the opportunity, not just to promote this event, which we think is very important, but also um, raise awareness for, for this cause, which has touched a, a lot of us at the police department and I know many folks in the city. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that. So now we're going to move on to our consent calendar. So, Madam City Clerk, could you please read the consent calendar? With pleasure, Madam Deputy Mayor. All matters listed under the consent calendar are considered by the council to be routine and will be enacted by one motion without discussion. If discussion is desired, that item may be removed and considered separately. Item number two, grand jury report, bike safety in San Mateo County, making bicycling safer in the county, response letter. Item number three, Bermuda Drive Bridge Replacement Project Amendment. Item number four, Edward Byrne 2023 Justice Assistance Grant Program Application. Item number five, Private Development and Right-of-Way Support Services Amendment. Item number six, General Plan Update, Supplemental Budget Appropriation and Amendment. And item number seven, Delaware Safe Routes to School Corridor Grant Funding Acceptance. Thank you. Is there any member of the council who would like to pull an item from the consent calendar? I'd like to have a brief discussion about item number seven. And the question I have is based on what's happened on Humboldt and so many working class people in this neighborhood, I want some assurances that when I vote for this and we bring the money in, that we're not going to lose parking for people that have to go to work every morning, especially with the high theft of rate in automobiles right now. Thank you, Council Member Hedges. Regarding the item, um, regarding the Safe Routes to School grant award that we are looking to accept with council action this evening, there will be a robust community engagement campaign that will go um, well in advance of any type of project coming before the council for approval. There'd also be subcommittee hearings as well. So I wanna assure you um, that staff has taken and duly noted uh, your concern about uh, the removal of parking spaces um, in when we're looking at basically um, bike, bikeway projects at the same time. Um, understanding that sometimes there would be some removal, so it's really striking that balance, but we gotta engage and communicate um, with the community and hear their feedback first um, before moving forward and then also looking to council consideration for any future project. Uh, my concern goes to even, we've had so many people that work with their tools that have had their vehicles stolen uh, with their tool racks on them and they can't go to work even. Uh, so we've got to make sure that people at least feel secure in their homes that they can keep an eye on their property. Thank you. Is, if any members of the public who wish to comment on any consent calendar item, now would be the time to make your comment. This is for consent calendar items only. I have no in-person uh, speaker slips for the consent calendar. I do have one hand raised. Um, it's a Samsung 
uh, call ID. Please go ahead, Samsung. Hi, my name is Diana Pettit, and I live at Gateway Commons, 3rd and South Fremont Street. And I would like to comment on number eight. And I would like to say that we had the Hance Me meeting, which is the North Central Homeowners Association meeting. And many of the people that live in this neighborhood are very much concerned with the general plan 2040. And I, part of Excuse that, me, this yes. is this is not a, a consent item. The, she's looking to comment on number eight. We, we have not reached, um, Diane, we have not reached that item yet. Um, so this is under consent calendar. If you're wanting to comment on the general plan, that will come up under item number eight, which will happen after public comment for items not on the agenda. Okay. Can I, can I comment on, eight, on the one that we're talking about on Humboldt? Uh, item number seven, the Delaware Safe Routes to School. Yes. Okay, you could comment on that. Okay. I would like to comment on that also because I live in North Central. It's very, very important that people remember that most of the people who live in this area walk to school, whether they're walking to Sunny Bray or they're taking the bus number 53 over to Trumbolt. Also with the school changes that we are going to deal with next year with Fiesta Gardens, it's very important for people to realize that a lot of the neighborhood and the population that, that go to our three schools, uh, Turnbolt, Sunny Bray, and Fair, um, and Fiesta Gardens, they don't really own cars. And um, if they do own cars, there will be too many cars in the area. And Delaware, even though there's bus number 53, a lot of the parents walk their kids to school. And that's what I would like to say, that we do need a better safety um, placement in our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Dave Cohen. Dave, go ahead. Hi, Dave Cohen, uh, Ethics San Mateo. I wanna make just a quick comment on uh, this item. You know, we have a ethics watch notice out a statement of position ethics watch on seeing how the performances of the city council in the city on fixing the problem that on Humboldt. And we would sure like to see some results from that before anything else moves ahead there. Um, let's solve some problems. Let's prove that the city can step up to what they pro promised to do before we do anything else. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam Deputy Mayor, I have uh, no other speakers. Thank you very much. Then uh, is there a motion from the council to approve the consent calendar? So moved. Thank you, second? Second. Thank you, could you please read the roll? Council Member Lorraine? Yes. Council Member Hedges? Yes. Council Member Newsom? Yes. Deputy Mayor Diaz-Nash? Yes. Motion carries 4-0. Thank you very much. Now we're going to move on to public comment. Members of the public wishing to comment on any item not appearing on the agenda may address the City Council at this time. State law prevents Council from taking action on any matter not on the agenda. Your comments may be referred to staff for follow-up. This public comment section is generally limited to a total of 15 minutes. However, that is subject to Council's discretion and can be extended if Council wishes to do so. If needed, an opportunity for additional public comment may also be provided later in the agenda. And one more note, we welcome speakers providing public comment, but please be advised this is a limited public forum. As such, speakers must stay on topic if speaking to a particular agenda item, and if speaking during general public comment, they must address matters within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city. If speakers fail to follow these rules, they will be warned, and if they continue to disregard our rules, their opportunity to speak will be ended. 
Madam Clerk, are there any requests for public comment? Yes, I have two um, speakers in the chambers. First speaker is Michael Sevilla, followed by Michael Reagan. Hello. I have been playing uh, golf at San Mateo Municipal Golf Course, now called Poplar Creek Golf Course, for 40 years. I've been a member of the men's golf club since the 80s. My brother was an assistant pro there before the closure and redesign in the 90s. So I feel like I have a certain institutional knowledge of the golf course. Since the VIP membership program changed to include a 14-day reservation window, the course has become a nightmare for resident card holders and other average golfers to be able to access the golf course, especially on weekends. The program is also, in my opinion, a money and goodwill loser for the city of San Mateo. The main problem is the fact that the VIP members are able to make reservations many days before the resident card holders and other golfers are allowed. The VIP members will make all the reservations for the best weekend tea times and then not show up or release the reservations back to the reservation app. The result is that many tea times go unused and resident card holders and other golfers have to scramble to find a way to play golf at Poplar Creek. I see so many no-shows and short shows. It's very discouraging. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Michael Reagan. Okay. Good evening. Um, My name is Michael Reagan uh, and currently president of the Bearsford Hillsdale Neighborhood Association. And I've been working also on the traffic action plan uh, since 2017. Most of you weren't on the council at the time. I don't think any of you were. Um, with, with the changes uh, in personnel, I've had to update the staff and council members on the project with the goal of completion. Uh, this is a timeline that you have of this particular year, since you guys have been on. Um, January 14th, I met with Adam Lorraine. He drove around all the schools in our area, showing him the various concerns. January 17th, um, Adam Lorraine sent me an email saying that he would update me on these items. As of today, he hasn't personally contacted me. Um, we sent a letter um, from the B uh, Bearsford Hillsdale Neighborhood Association uh, to the City Council with a request to prioritize the failed and planned installation for pedestrians and vehicle safety. No action has been taken. Um, March 15th, I met with Hillsdale High School at the, at the high school. Um, in attendance was the principal, Jeff Gilbert, Drew Colbert, and staff from Public Works, along with Adam. We, we discussed the issues surrounding uh, Hillsdale High School. No action has been taken. May 23rd, Jeff Gilbert sent a letter to um, Drew Colbert, Azalea Mitch, Adam Lorraine, uh, and myself representing uh, the Bearsford Hillsdale with a list of possible next steps. Um, our hope was that these items would be resolved during the summer. Um, June 14th, uh, Azalea Smith, uh, Mitch sent me another uh, email, future considerations for other projects, but they had nothing to do with what we had been discussing. But those things still have not been done. September 4th, uh, most of my time is going to be used up. So you have a list of the things that um, um, the, the high school uh, principal, Jeff Gilbert, was, and I and Public Works had talked about, um, about prioritizing these items. Um, so may, making it more personal, when we had district elections, we were hoping that the person that was elected would be, would be more responsible. So this doesn't go out to the rest of you, but with Adam, I've had personal contact with you regarding these issues, and we've received a lot of lip service, but nothing's really been done. I was hoping that you would inst, you know, instigate the um, approval of these items. They're not very expensive, especially when I've been to many, many meetings, 
and I've seen the agendas and the monies that's been spent on other items. These are our priorities for the students and the residents of, of, of Bearsford Hillsdale, and I'm asking you as a group to make them a priority in the future. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker um, remote, um, we have Ligia Andrade Zuniga. Please go ahead, Ligia. You'll need to unmute yourself. Sorry, it took me so long to unmute. Um, thank you so much. Um, hello, council members, staff. Um, I wanted to invite people from the public um, who have students in our district and all over San Mateo County. Um, I am part of the Latino Leadership Coalition of the Bay Area. And we created a speaker series for Latinx Heritage Month. Our next event is this Friday, October 6th at Carrington Hall in uh, Redwood City at Sequoia High School. And it's free to the public. Um, there's going to be uh, speakers and food and um, entertainment. So if anyone would like to join us, they're more than welcome to. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is James Clark. Please go ahead, James. Okay, here we go. Hi, I uh, sent an email out to the clerk earlier for with a comment. I didn't know if that was already being addressed or not. It was around the 2040 city plan. Um, basically, I wanted to provide a comment on that, uh, generally just particularly around the noise. My wife and I actually live along B Street, along the section without traffic lights between 9th and 5th Streets. Um, because of the larger street size here and the easier access to the freeway, we actually experience a lot of noise here through here due to loud cars and particularly Harley Davidson motorcycles racing up and down the street, oh. often late at night. Um, I've actually been in contact with local law enforcement on the issue as late night parties at the Yuppie Bar slash Cantina, whatever they call themselves these days, and the service staff at Esfetis getting off work have recently become quite a bit more problematic. Uh, I've actually been sharing video footage of what I've collected on a lot of the bad behavior and repeat offenders who find it very fun to race it down what we now call the San Mateo Speedway. Um, my, my intention on all this isn't really to directly attack certain individuals or businesses, but more just in a hope to affect some- I believe this comment is about the general plan item, item eight. Yes. Madam Clerk, so we're going to take that item here shortly. This is just regular general public comment at this time. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Sure. I have no other speakers. Thank you very much. Then I will close public comment. Uh, and we will move on to old business. Uh, draft General Plan 2040, Community Design and Historic Resources, Conservation, open space and recreation and noise elements. And I believe we're going to have a presentation from Zachary Dahl, our Deputy Director of Community Development. So I will turn it over to Deputy Director Dahl. Good evening, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, uh, members of the City Council, um, Zach Dahl, um, Interim Community Development Director, and I'm joined tonight by Joanna Jansen, um, Principal with PlaceWorks, um, to present um, the draft general plan. This is meeting one of three, um, and so this will go ahead and get started, and we'll be coming back to you um, two meetings later this month. As, um, as we go ahead and as we go ahead and get started, I do want to acknowledge the, the team that is supporting it. Um, we're here presenting today, but we've got a great team, both in our core team, our technical advisory committee, as well as our consultant team who has been supporting this um, general plan update effort for uh, more than five years now. So um, it takes a lot, of, a lot of staff effort to get us where we are. And so we're, we're um, proud to represent that group here before you this evening. For tonight's discussion, um, we'll start with our presentation. Um, then move to clarifying questions, um, receive public comment, and then move on to council discussion and then ultimately direction. And for tonight's agenda, we are focusing on community design and historic resources, conservation, open space and recreation, um, and noise. 
Um, the, the other four elements will be discussed um, at our subsequent meetings. And we'll also be touching on um, the draft environmental impact report that was prepared to support the project. Um, so starting this project is our vision statement. Um, this was crafted at the beginning of the general plan update process and really is forms the foundation that the general plan has been subsequently built upon. Um, milestones, um, we started this effort back in fall of 2018, starting with the community-wide vision, um, moving on to our um, identification of our study areas, um, our range of land use alternatives, of which we then finalized, then in 2022, um, selected our preferred land use and circulation scenarios, um, and then moved on to goals, policies, and actions, and that then led to the publication of our draft general plan, which um, came out this summer. And so right now we are in um, the, the back end of the, of the draft general plan phase of the process um, with our three meetings um, before you in the month of October. And then that keeps us on track to have a general plan and final EIR um, that's ready for council certification and adoption um, in the first few months of 2024. I um, also want to highlight um, our online resource page, um, which has a variety of tools, um, pieces of information, and other resources to support a greater understanding and dive deeper into various aspects of the draft general plan. And that is strivesanmateo.org. I um, also want to spend a few minutes highlighting the general plan community outreach effort that has been going on. Um, Starting in July, um, this started with citywide mailers, both a newsletter and then subsequently uh, meeting notification notice. Um, we held a virtual workshop. Um, the month of September, we uh, had five different district town hall meetings around the city. Um, we've also provided presentations to various community groups, um, had self-guided open house displays at various city facilities, as well as a variety of other pop-up events throughout the city. And then also um, robust community or social, um, social media outreach and other mailers um, to support awareness. Um, this just highlights the map of where our district town halls occurred with our most recent one happening um, last Thursday um, over at Nueva School in District 3. Um, all, in addition to our community engagement, um, we go through our three um, meeting series starting with the general plan subcommittee, which we held in August. Um, we held two meetings before the Planning Commission in September, and we're now here before you um, in the month of October. And um, we do want to reiterate, um, these meetings were collecting feedback and, and ultimately in direction from council, but no final decisions are being made at this point. This will all lead toward um, final adoption hearings, which will take place in the beginning of 2024. Um, some of the themes, and I want to highlight these are just a few of the themes that have been coming out throughout the course of this, this discussion over the past two and a half months. Um, there are a variety of topics focusing both um, concern and support for new development to meet housing and um, the um, housing needs and state requirements. Um, additional focus on retail and neighborhood serving um, commercial districts. Uh, maintaining um, San Mateo's unique char character and fabric. Um, additional focus on, on senior and age-friendly issues, as well as safety and, and circulation and historic resources. Um, when we went to our, the general plan subcommittee in August, um, we received additional focused input on, on making sure the general plan is legible and easily accessible to members of the public, um, focused on enhanced placemaking, um, and then looking at other aspects, including supporting local businesses and other ways that, um, that the general plan can result in a positive impact on the community. Um, when we went before the Planning Commission, we received additional focus feedback um, on different areas, including on historic resources, safety and circulation, air quality, um, different input around land use, um, and then also um, looking at our open space and recreational element. Um, so at this point, we're going to start with an overview of the draft general plan and then and move into an overview of the environmental impact report and then the three elements before you this evening. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Joanna. Great. Thanks so much, Zach. Uh, as Zach said, I'm Joanna Jansen. I am a principal with PlaceWorks. Uh, and we are the consultant supporting the city on the general plan update. 
I'm going to uh, run through a brief overview of the general plan, technical update to the climate action plan, and the EIR um, to provide you with some basis for your discussion this evening. We have been explaining the general plan in terms of some of the 10 big ideas that you see on this slide. This helps translate the detailed policies and actions of the general plan into helping people understand how the general plan might actually show up and be visible in San Mateo and how it might impact day-to-day um, -day life and things like neighborhood fabric, um, preserving nature, supporting the local economy, uh, and focusing on equity, for example. The uh, contents of the general plan are organized into the elements that you see here on this slide. As Zach said, we are going to go through all of these elements uh, tonight and in the next two meetings throughout October. Uh, tonight we're going to be focusing on community design and historic resources, conservation, open space, parks and recreation, and noise. The general plan also includes other important components like a glossary and an introduction uh, and implementation plan for all of its actions. All of these contents have three key themes woven throughout the document. Those are sustainability, environmental justice, and community engagement. And these show up in every single element of the general plan because we believe they're very important and need to be comprehensively addressed throughout the document. We want to make sure that uh, those uh, presence of these themes is highlighted visually as well as in the policy and action content. This page gives you a little bit of a preview of how the general plan looks. The general plan is organized into goals that include the abbreviation of the element, each goal is numbered, and then the policies and actions under that goal are numbered um, following the number of the goal. And every policy or action that is in support of one of the three themes is labeled with one of the icons you see here on this slide for easy identification. I mentioned the idea of implementation and an implementation plan for the general plan. Obviously, it's very important to make sure that all of the work we're putting into developing the general plan gets translated into real world actions and change uh, that the community has told us they want to see. So the implementation plan will include a to-do list for city staff organized by department, priority, time frame, et cetera. And then that'll be something that the city can consider uh, each year as part of the budget prioritization and other ongoing city processes. So for example, um, the, the city might recommend a specific list of actions based on um, information from your departmental staff, and then that will come before the council for consideration as part of your budget. But we see the general plan as a very important source for recommendations to the council mm -hmm. about budget decisions uh, each fiscal year. And obviously understanding that uh, for everything the council does, um, initiatives will be prioritized based on funding that's available. In addition to the general plan, the uh, project overall includes a technical update to the climate action plan. San Mateo has had uh, an adopted climate action plan in this current version since 2020. The climate action plan serves as the city's comprehensive strategy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it was first adopted as a, one of the implementation programs of your current uh, 2030 general plan back in 2015. It was most recently updated in 2020, and what's critical about the Climate Action Plan is that it serves as a CEQA qualified greenhouse gas reduction strategy. That means it meets certain criteria under state law that enable um, individual projects to demonstrate consistency with the Climate Action Plan and with the greenhouse gas reduction mitigation measures um, that the city has already adopted through the Climate Action Plan. Because it covers future development, it's very important to just update the climate action plan to make sure that it's consistent with the assumptions in the general plan. So the technical update does that. The other important component that uh, we are going to be asking you to consider um, at the time of adoption and certification early next year is the environmental impact report. So I wanted to cover the draft environmental impact report a little bit right now. Um, the EIR or environmental impact report is required under state law to cover the general plan. And so the project that's included in the EIR is uh, general plan 2040, including its land use map, the projected build out or the amount of development that the general plan would allow, and the potential environmental impacts of the goals, policies, and actions of the general plan, as well as the technical update to the climate action plan. 
the EIR includes what we call the study area, meaning the geographic territory that's covered by the document uh, of the city limits and the sphere of influence because the general plan includes land use designations um, within that area. So the EIR for some topics includes spatial and for other topics includes quantitative analyses of development within this study area shown in pink on this slide. So as I said, that's also the footprint of the general plan land use map and the EIR analyzes the potential impacts of um, development consistent with this general plan land use map. For the quantitative analyses, things like how many traffic trips there are going to be or how many air quality pollutants will be emitted, we used uh, the project build out that you see on this slide and looking at um, the total net, the net change and the total build out in 2040 uh, of uh, total, total build out of about 65,000 housing units and a population of 160,000 people and 79,000 jobs. As you know, throughout the general plan process, we've really uh, focused development on 10 study areas that were identified with input from the community and uh, council direction to really focus intensification and future development and change in areas near transit services and jobs. Uh, many of these areas uh, include spots where current buildings are aging or vacant and are likely to transition over the lifetime of the general plan and or areas where property owners came to the city and said that they're interested in considering redevelopment. So within the 10 study areas shown on this slide, the, uh, that includes 92% of the new housing and 89% of the new jobs that I showed on the previous slide. Mm -hmm. uh, just taking a step back and providing a brief overview about CEQA, CEQA or the California Environmental Quality Act is the state's primary environmental protection law and this is the law that requires the EIR that uh, I'm giving you an overview of um, tonight. It's intended to disclose the potential physical environmental impacts and identify mitigation measures for those uh, impacts, as well as describing feasible project alternatives um, that specifically are targeted at environmental impacts. Um, so just really important message from this slide, CEQA does not dictate project approval or denial. CEQA is intended as an informational law to make sure that you and the community are, are acting with information about the potential environmental impacts of a project. In the case of the general plan EIR, it's what we call a program level EIR. So you might um, oftentimes consider a project level EIR on an individual project or a building that is proposed to be built. When we are considering adopting a plan uh, that might cover many different projects over its life, we call that a program level EIR. So we don't have information on individual potential projects. Um, but those projects will be allowed to tear off the general plan EIR, uh, assuming that it's certified. And that can help to streamline future environmental review for projects that are consistent with the general plan. Consistent with state law, uh, the EIR evaluates all of the environmental topics noted on this slide. And for uh, all of the bullet points here that uh, have a little asterisk after them, those are the impacts that are found to be less than significant, primarily because the general plan includes policies and actions that would avoid or lessen environmental impacts. For the topics in bold, air quality, noise, and wildfire, we did identify what we call uh, in CEQA terms, significant and unavoidable impacts. Uh, and I'm going to address each one of those individually. So air quality, um, significant and unavoidable impacts means that even with the mitigation measures and the policies that are included in the EIR and the general plan, uh, there are quantitative thresholds that would be exceeded from the amount of development and associated traffic and construction of that development and therefore uh, the impact is significant and unavoidable. So this, as you can see from this slide, includes significant uh, air, excuse me, construction period and operation period impacts, um, as well as a cumulative impact from development under the general plan, as well as other development in the region. Um, similarly, for noise, we found uh, an exceedance of noise levels on one a roadway segment on First Avenue, west of B Street, as well as, um, because of that impact, uh, cum unacceptable cumulative traffic noise. 
And then for the new, relatively new, um, CEQA topic of wildfire, uh, we found that development uh, under the general plan would have the potential to increase population buildings and infrastructure in wildfire prone areas. Uh, and again, because we found that individual impact, we also identified that it would contribute to a cumulative impact um, of increased wildfire risk in the region. So cumulative impacts that I've talked about a couple times there mean that we have to look not only at the pro impacts of this project itself, but also how that would play out with what we expect to be um, other development nearby. So we did look at the general plan EIR in the context of citywide impacts, uh, as well as cumulatively considerable impacts. And those are pretty consistent in terms of the topic areas. I wanted to touch on the alternatives analysis. I mentioned that CEQA does require the EIR to consider a range of reasonable alternatives to the project. So in the wording of state law, CEQA alternatives have to be um, both reasonable alternatives, they have to be alternatives that would attain most of the project objectives, and they also have to be alternatives that would avoid or lessen the project impact. So many of you and many of the folks who have been involved in this project um, for a long time know that we did a, a very extensive alternatives process as part of developing the general plan land use map. Um, and it can be uh, understandably confusing because that process used the term alternatives, CEQA uses the term alternatives, um, but they really are intended to serve two very different um, projects. So we had our kind of citywide alternatives A, B, and C back mm -hmm. when we did the land use alternatives. CEQA asks us to look at a much more narrow range of alternatives, specifically those that both meet project objectives and avoid or lessen project impacts. Uh, and so that is some context for the range of alternatives that we evaluated in the draft EIR, which included a legally required no project alternative, as well as a reduced traffic noise alternative, again, um, aimed specifically at reducing that noise impact that I discussed earlier. Finally, since the EIR does identify significant impacts um, as, and discloses those, uh, there are options for the city to consider uh, approving any project that has significant and unavoidable impacts through using something that's called a statement of overriding considerations. That statement has to identify how the project's benefits outweigh its potential impacts. Um, some of those are often things like social or economic benefits of a project, like providing affordable housing or supporting local businesses. Um, the city has to make findings that support this conclusion and include those findings in the record of the project approval. This is just a diagram that gives you a quick visual overview of the EIR process and where we are overall. I wanna be clear that uh, it's important to explain and make sure that we're talking about the EIR as part of the public process. It was out for a 45 day public comment period from August 11th to September 25th. That public comment period um, has closed and we are currently in the process of reviewing the comments that we've received um, from the public. Uh, so obviously if the council uh, would like to uh, direct staff to provide um, any additional information as part of the final EIR, that will be the next step in this process. As you can see here on the diagram, we're gonna be responding to every comment received as part of the final EIR and then bringing that back for consideration at a planning commission meeting in early 2024 and ultimately to you. Um, and we would be asking the council to certify the EIR that will consist of both the final EIR and the draft EIR. So with that, I'm going to move into a quick overview of the general plan elements that you're gonna be discussing tonight. First is the community design and historic resources element, and it covers the topics that you see listed here on this slide, including natural landscapes and the urban forest, historic resources, public art, um, and residential and mixed use design. We have heard a lot about design and character throughout the general plan update process, including um, input about gateways and street trees, um, both support and opposition for designating new historic resources and establishing new historic districts. I know you've received um, strong interest in that topic from the community. Um, is that we should establish a process for a historic district designation that requires approval by affected property owners um, and that the city should update the historic resources survey. Uh, this slide uh, summarizes some of the planning commission recommendations about this element, 
including um, addressing trees and tree equity, equity, the definition for historic resources, um, and references to step backs on upper floors. The general plan subcommittee also offered some feedback on this. Um, we're going to have these um, feedback on all of the elements that you're discussing tonight, and you have this in detail in your um, agenda report, so I'm not going to read um, each one of these, but we can come back to any of these slides as part of your discussion uh, if that's helpful. I do want to highlight uh, the staff recommended changes to this element, um, including consideration of some of the recommendations um, from these other bodies and from the community to the policies and the actions that are listed here. Uh, and also just note that staff is also planning to begin a separate process to update the city's historic preservation policies uh, in early 2024 and provide some additional detail beyond the level of detail that the general plan policies and actions are going to include. Uh, next is the conservation, open space, and recreation element. So it covers natural resources in San Mateo, as well as open space preservation, creeks, um, air quality as a natural resource. And importantly, this is an element where we really cover um, parks and recreation. We heard from the community about the importance of protecting Marina Lagoon and uh, restoring San Mateo waterways and groundwater resources, phasing out gas powered maintenance equipment, expanding access to Coyote Point, and just in general, ensuring the park and open space is sufficient as the city grows and adds new development. The general plan subcommittee was interested in adding uh, additional support for the expansion of, of cultural and entertainment uh, resources and also uh, funding for parks and recreation. From the Planning Commission, we heard some interest in um, adding a new action under the goals to mitigate outdoor air quality. This was a topic of significant concern for the Planning Commission and addressing park access east of El Camino and east of 101. Again, this slide summarizes the staff recommended changes that are in your um, agenda report with some revisions to existing policies and some suggestions for additional new actions to add. And finally, uh, the noise element addresses both exterior and interior noise, as well as measuring and regulating uh, and reducing noise. We have heard concerns about noise from the community, including uh, construction noise and traffic noise. Uh, we did not get detailed recommendations from the general plan subcommittee or planning commission, sorry, um, but staff is recommending a change to address uh, and clarify uh, both policy N1.3 and table N-1. I'll hand it back over to Zach to cover some next steps. Great, thank you, Joanna. Um, so moving forward, um, as we noted earlier, um, we're here before you this evening for the first of three meetings to go over each element within the draft general plan um, based on the direction you provide tonight and at our uh, upcoming two meetings. We'll then move forward with preparation of the um, a general plan that's ready for um, adoption and the final environmental impact report. And then um, we will be coming back to both the Planning Commission and then um, um, you, the Council, um, in March, February and March of 24 um, for consideration and adoption hearings. Um, so for this evening, um, we are looking to focus the discussion around the three elements that um, were just outlined, community design and historic resources, conservation, open space and recreation, and noise. And so um, to fr help um, frame that discussion, um, we are um, looking for input on the staff recommended revisions to each element, if, if those are revisions you support or if you wanna see changes. And then um, based on all of the other input from Planning Commission, General Plan Subcommittee, and the public, as well as your own um, input and engagement throughout the course of this process, are there other changes or updates that, that should be made to the draft general plan as we move to prepare the final version? Um, I also do want to note that um, we do have backup slides that go through each one of the recommendations. That these are the attachments three, four, and five in your agenda report, so happy to pull those up to help facilitate a discussion or if you have any questions. Um, so with that, that does conclude our presentation, and we're available if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Um, I guess I'm going to look at my fellow council members to see who would like to start the questioning. Perhaps Council Member Lorraine. 
Thank you, through the chair. Um, Zach uh, and Joanna, thank you for the presentation. Um, I was just curious if the recommendation from the general plan subcommittee, which I think is under the, I want to say the open space uh, conservation recreation element related to increasing, I think like exploring cultural, uh, like an arts uh, in our downtown that I think was in uh, Joanna's presentation. I was curious, it, I, I get the sense that this may not be included in staff's recommendations and um, is, is that the case? I think that is what I am seeing. Yes, with that input, um, we didn't have a specific recommendation, but if there's council interest, um, and if you wanted to provide us with some parameters, we're, we would be happy to work and fold that into the general plan. So I think that would be something if, if there's council interest, we can definitely work to explore how to fold in a policy or action to support that. Okay, thank you. And I think going into, I wanted to ask about, you know, I, we, we received a lot of public comment um, related to historic resources and uh, protection and designations. And um, a number of them were asking for changes to either, you know, plans, policies, or actions, uh, some you know, indicating uh, for example, like specific language relating to conformance with state and federal laws and CEQA. But uh, I was curious uh, to, I, I wanted to ask, you know, uh, the staff recommendation to combine, uh, I think it was numbers 5.1 and 5.2 uh, into a new policy, let's see, or combine, right, draft uh, CD 5.1 and 5.2. Um, you know, when I read the language there, um, I, I, I wonder if you feel that the language here as presented might indeed sort of re reflect this, this interest in, in conforming with state and federal laws and CEQA. So with that regard, I think that's clear that any any effort we do would need to conform with and be consistent with state and federal rules and, and regulations with regard to historic resources and with any uh, applicable CEQA thresholds. And so I think whether that language is in there or not, that would definitely be part of any policy initiative we move forward with. So for that particular recommendation that was submitted, I staff is fine whether it's included in the definition or not. I think it materially we would be following the same process um, for how we move forward when we have our more focused um, historic policy, preservation policy discussion, which we are looking to get underway beginning of, of the new year. Thank you. And I wondered if we could talk just maybe a little bit more with a little bit more detail about this initiative that you just brought up that we're, that the city will undergo in the not too distant future, um, maybe particularly related to uh, establishing the, the local criteria that I think is maybe alluded to here in this, um, in this combined 5.1 and 5.2, would that be possible? Yes, I'll, I'll go ahead and get started and I think what we're doing is we're responding to a lot of community interest on this topic and recognizing that a lot more information is needed to have a good discussion and, and comprehensive community understanding of where we want to go with our historic um, preservation policies. And so there's a lot of comments that are coming in that are getting into details that are, are not best addressed within the general plan. And so having a more focused policy discussion around the city's preservation um, policies, including how we want to approach historic de um, district designation is kind of what we're envisioning at a high level. And um, I don't know if uh, turn it over to the city manager, assistant city manager, if maybe we want to provide any additional details, but I know it's an effort we're still working to um, formulate, but we do recognize and we want to move it forward sooner rather than later. I don't know if there's much to add, but I think we, 
we do see that as the first step is just establishing the designation process so that we have something that's transparent and that is consistent for um, all, all um, resources that, that would seek a designation to follow and that's clear and that's the same for everybody. Thank you. No further questions at this time. Thank you. Councilmember Hedges. I want to better understand this. I have a little follow up on Adam. So you've probably seen a volume of emails on the historic district that we received, and there were some very specific things in some of the emails. And I guess the question I'm going to ask you is, uh, Several times was mentioned contributors being included in a historic district. That sounds to me like something that doesn't belong in a general plan, but may belong later in something that we do to form, actually form a historic district uh, uh, legislation. Yes, we, we did have a chance to reach out to the historic consultant that's supporting the, the general plan update effort. And, and her comments were that is that, um, she was kind of saying that it can go either way. This would not necessarily put an undue burden on the city if it were added. It's adding a level of detail that would be part of the historic district process. And it's a standard term used when evaluating impacts to historic districts under CICRA. On the other hand, her note was that it also doesn't necessarily, it's not necessary because the historic district documentation would include contributing and non-contributing properties. So and essentially, she, her comment was you'd be repeating yourself. So I think- I see. The staff's recommendation would be to focus this type of, of recommendation on this more focused policy effort and flush it out there and, and establish local criteria for how we would want to evaluate these as part of the historic designation process. Um, but I, our, our consultant noted that we would be looking at them either way, whether those specific references were in the general plan or not. So what I hear you saying is that it's already going to be dealt with. It will be dealt with as part of a more focused policy effort. Okay. Um, that's it for right now. I'll have some others a little later. Councilmember Newsom. Uh, can you go back one slide for a minute? The one that had all the... Yeah, thank you. Uh, I was just... And I'm sorry, I, I've read a lot of this, but there's things that I just haven't read, I think. Um, what is the intent by the idea of a scenic corridor? Like, uh, what what does that even mean? Uh, it, like, and we've added to the extent feasible to maintain them, but I, I, I'm just, could you give me an example of something that we would consider a scenic corridor? <laughs> So this originated, this is in our current general plan, 2030, and um, this was a bit of a challenge because we don't have any specific designated scenic corridors. I mean, this is probably most commonly known when you go on sections of Highway 280, you are identified as scenic corridors. We are in proximity, but not directly adjacent. And so what we were trying to do is how do we tie this to something specific since we don't necessarily have any in the city of San Mateo. So um, that's where we did note that the county's general plan does have scenic corridors at this point. There are none that are directly adjacent to city limits. Um, there are some that are in proximity to our unincorporated areas to the west. Um, and so if we want to preserve this concept in the general plan, this was our recommendation as to kind of balance that and tie it to something more tangible because that was the challenge in our current general plan is we were trying to understand where exactly this applied. So that was, and then making sure to the extent feasible because we're balancing different considerations. And since we don't have any specifically identified scenic corridors, maybe that's what you're sensing with that language. But right now we don't have any specific designated ones within the city. I'm going to okay. yield to my okay. neighbor here and let him ask a follow-up question. Uh, so uh, I saw the scenic quarters, and I was also as perplexed as he was, because, but that sort of smacks of what I grew up with. In Kansas City, during the City Beautiful movement, they didn't do grand buildings except for the Union Station. They did these scenic, scenic parkways with a lot of tree plantings, a lot of art and statues. So that sounds to me, is that what a, you would consider a scenic corridor? like the Olmsted movement in the turn of the century? Within our general plan context, I, I, I definitely understand what you're referring to there. 
I don't necessarily know that that's what our general plan, current general plan is looking to, but it does use the term. And I know um, the Alameda, our Al, um, Alameda de los Polgos was referenced, but we, we were looking for, I mean, unless there's a specific policy to establish scenic corridors in that form, that wouldn't necessarily be what this applies to. This is more um, something like um, what you would see on, on portions of Highway 280, where you've got um, kind of more of a natural setting that's, that's unobstructed by, by um, development. I think the closest thing may be the eucalyptus trees through Burlingame, possibly. They would consider it that, I think. I don't believe they're identified Sorry. as a scenic corridor. I, I can actually just because I've had to deal with scenic corridors in my past in Half Moon Bay on the coast side. So if you look at Highway 1 and you come down to the south side of Half Moon Bay, you'll see a fire tower. It's just your experience as you're driving through and whether or not you can see the foothills um, unobstructed. Um, that's kind of one, one example of the scenic corridors that I've had to deal with in the past and just the level of development and does it impede your view and your feel as you're driving through the community, if that's for an example. Okay, uh, moving along to tree equity. Um, I am a huge proponent of adding trees, especially to neighborhoods where we lack them. Um, I also feel as though adding trees along busier streets kind of slows down traffic. It's, a, it's yet another way to kind of uh, slow traffic in corridors that are residential and should be slowed down. Um, one thing that I've had a couple people in my neighborhood tell me about, and it actually strikes a chord because I went through this myself, is it, could we put a clause or some comment in there about the potential removal of trees that are non-native trees or trees that are you know damaging to uh, for example, the liquid ambar trees uh, really destroy our sidewalks. The eucalyptus trees along um, the northern part of El Camino Real are going to have to be removed at some point. Could we make sure that we include or have some language around the idea of, like, if we remove a tree, that we try to replace a tree with native trees or trees that are less destructive to uh, sidewalks, roadways, et cetera? Is that... Would that, is that the right place for that, or should that just not, should that be separated, I guess, is the question. It could be. I, I think there's, there's a level of detail that probably makes more sense in the actual program that helps implement these, because we've got a, a handful of policies, both here and in other elements, that focus on urban, urban maintaining our urban forests, supporting street trees. That type of, of of detail would probably be better placed within the actual program itself. Okay. Um, because while well, natives usually are the best type of tree, they don't always make, make the best street tree. So you usually have more of a curated list of trees that are appropriate as tree, street trees and you're looking at roots, how they spread other things. So right. if you plant when you're not, then I'm tearing up your streets and sidewalks around them. Um, but yeah, I, there, I think there's a lot of logic in, in developing that, but that might be a bit too detailed for the general plan, unless there's something specific that you really want to make sure is carried through. Nope, oh, that's great. Great answer. Thank you. Um, I think we could talk a lot, and I think we're going to be talking a lot more about historical preservation and historical neighborhoods, so I'm going to leave that and let public comment come and probably have more feedback there. Um, one of the things that came up in my district in particular was that we had some streets that were not considered arterial when we started the general plan process. And over the last four or five years, they've been upgraded by Caltrans to uh, arterials. That's specifically fifth and ninth. Um, one of the questions that I'm getting, and we're going to hear a lot about this in public comment, I think, today as well, is, is you know, what is the oversight to, to if Caltrans comes in and updates or up, upgrades a, a, a roadway that we have, what do we as a city have uh, control over? What do we not have control over? And in, in this example, you know, what are things that we can do to prevent that from becoming, uh, you know, a very busy arterial and maintain the integrity of the neighborhood? That, 
Does that make sense as a question or have I rambled too much? <laughs> Definitely. I, no, I think that's a really good question. And I mean, we've been hearing a lot of those comments. And so we're working with our, our public works team right now. And so when we come back in two weeks to discuss our circulation element, um, okay. we're going to be including some recommendations that kind of get speak to that specifically and how we can address those concerns and, and some of the best ways for us to move forward. Okay. Thank you. That's, yeah. Uh, Rich would like to add, a, add on to that as well. When you and I discussed this, you said later there's some specific things we can do with traffic counts and things like that to try to remove it. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. I, I hesitate to get a little bit ahead of it because I know our public works team is still I'm working with our general plan team to kind of formulate language. Um, but yes, we're going to look to bring forward some policies for your consideration that set the framework for how we could look at um, those because they do come from Caltrans, how we could look at them locally and what might what factors we could consider and how we want to move forward if we have designations that are of community concern. So I, um, I think we can speak to that in more detail when we come back in two weeks with our circulation. Element. Yeah, I, when I talked to you, I said it didn't make sense to me. <laughs> That's all the questions I have for now. I'm sure I'll have more later. Thank you. All right, then thank you very much. And number one, just thanks to everybody on the team. Once again, it's been years, as you know, um, of effort and really appreciate it. And I think the community is really starting to come together around it. So that's that's good, good, good work. Um, I'm, I do want to ask some questions about the historic resource and community design section. Uh, more clarifying in the beginning about what can and cannot be done. So my understanding is that there are state and federal regulations that really determine uh, the process for uh, determining historic resources in districts and that those state and federal regulations trump local regulations in terms of saying this is how you become a historic resource or a district, but that what the city really can do is once that designation happens, the city says, here's how we're going to implement it. So am I correct in understanding that the state and, and national process is really what we follow for determining if something is going to be a, a historic district? Yeah, so because there, I think it's important to note there's kind of two categories to look at. One is the environmental review or the CEQA category, and those are the, that criteria is fairly um, clear and specific in how you need to look at um, a project and any potential impacts to a historic resource. And there's there's specific questions that need to be evaluated. When it comes to the policy side, um, yes, you have your your federal le um, level Secretary of the Interior standards. You have your state state processes um, overseen by the Office of Historic preservation and then you have local discretion in how we set up our preservation mm -hmm. policies and and we do want to follow state and federal guidance for how you move forward how you evaluate for consistency but the um, local at the local level we do have discretion as to how and what we preserve and the levels and requirements that go into it. and I think that would be really what we would get into with this focus policy discussion is what level um, of local historic preservation policies do we want to have um, but we would want to make sure they're aligned with state and federal right. Um, practices. Right. Okay. Thank you. So in looking at some of the um, comments and suggestions, based on what you're saying and my understanding, um, there were some that I don't think would be feasible in the process. So number one, one of the comments was removing the term eligible as part of the definition of historic resources in policy CD 5.3. And that's part of that, that wouldn't make sense in this, because it's going to, it's part of the national process. So it's part of the national determination. So us saying, let's remove eligible, really that wouldn't be feasible. We wouldn't recommend that eligible be removed because it's a consideration both under CEQA and under your historic preservation policies. And so that's, that's gonna be a term that would apply whether it's specifically in the policy or not. So we would recommend keeping it um, since there are sp um, specific attributes and statuses that go with that. Okay, thank you. And then also another uh, recommendation or comment was not to designate any new historic districts. Um, and I would say my question is that also isn't something that would be part of your recommendation, I would think, because that contravenes 
a national process for determining a historic district? I would say I, something like that is probably best considered as part of that more focused policy discussion that we're, we're looking to, to kick off in the beginning of 2024, but not necessarily make it, it take that kind of firm commitment within the general plan. We would look for the general plan to set the framework and then to facilitate a more focused policy discussion about um, where our local community priorities are when it comes to these policies. So the, the general plan would say you could have historic districts or resources, and then the local would say, here's what that would mean in San Mateo versus some other city. When you look at the term historic resource, a district is a, falls under that a definition. And so a district still is applicable whether you've specifically designated one. So if you're in CEQA, if you're doing environmental review, you're going to look for that characteristic depending on your project. So it, it, a district is something that falls within that historic resource definition for consideration. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. And in terms of the, the local discussion that we're going to start next year, there's going to be a large community outreach component of that, correct? We would, we would look to have that, that community discussion as part of any, any policy process we have. Yeah, that's great. Um, and then moving on to the objective design standards, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I appreciate the staff recommendation change to develop and adopt ODS for new mixed use and commercial development to provide a clear understanding of the city's expectation for new project design, including context appropriate architectural styles and pedestrian friendly design. Um, I'm wondering if there is room in the general plan to be a little more specific about that because context specific design specifically looking at something like the downtown area, that we want to not only encourage new development, but also make sure that development matches our existing development and particularly the older buildings. So that there was a, a comment in here about removing um, the rhythm and scale of things, and I'm wondering if it shouldn't be more appropriate to keep that in because we really want to make sure that we're, we're saying we want new development, but we want it to be in context of what we have. Yeah, I think for these two recommendations, they're exactly that recommendations. And if, if the council's looking um, to see other, um, a, a different mix of terms used there or bring back some of the ones that are already in there, um, we were, these, these recommendations were informed both by the community input we've received um, during this outreach phase, as well as the discussion we've been having as part of our objective design standards process, which is moving along concurrently. Um, but yeah, if there's a different mix of terms or um, of, is, a, adjustments to these, we're happy to fold those in. These are, these are recommendations to kind of start the discussion. Okay, great. Um, and then a question on the circulation element. Uh, there was, as part of the write-up, it said, at a goal that would identify a time frame, the city plans to implement all planned infrastructure projects and the number of city staff that would be required to meet that goal. That just seems like an impossible thing to do at this point in time for you to know everything you have to do and how much it's going to take to get it done. Was I misinterpreting what that said? That would be, I, I think, um, being able to quantify it and set specific timelines, I mean, that, that would be a big undertaking and obviously it's, it's going to be a moving target for a number of reasons. Um, we, we can speak to it more specifically when we have our public work staff here at our next meeting. Um, but yeah, we can we can be prepared to kind of weigh in in more detail on on, on our perspective on on if how feasible or realistic that recommendation would be to implement. Because I'm all about understanding impact and, and what it's going to take, but I, I don't want you going down the a rabbit hole of doing things that aren't terribly realistic. Um, and then in terms of the EIR, when we talked about really looking at the impact of development and um, Joanna said that it was we looked at the larger amount as opposed to individual projects. Was there an analysis of concurrent development in the EIR? Because I know one of the things I've heard from the community a lot is that it's one thing to look at the impact of a particular project, but when you have so many different projects going on at the same time, 
in relatively the same place, the impact is different than looking at the singular impact of each project. Sure, I'm happy to speak to that a little bit. Fundamentally, the EIR is an EIR on what the um, potential physical environmental impacts would be of the development that is built and on the ground and in operation in the year 2040. Okay. So the EIR, just like a program EIR, the EIR looks at an end state. It does consider construction period impacts in some of the topics like air quality, for example, and emissions that might happen from construction activities for construction um, equipment, same with the noise um, uh, analysis, but it's not kind of a, um, it, it looks at a, a, a finite endpoint rather than kind of a constantly evolving on the ground situation, mm -hmm. which of course is, you know, what's going to happen right. in the real world. Right. Um, but the EIR is a tool really intended to say, okay, after this is constructed and in place, what are the impacts going to be at that point in time? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I think kind of building on that, we would use our project specific environmental reviews to kind of look at more of that um, context and cumulative specific impact. So because we really don't know how and when each of these various developments are going to occur. But as the proposals actually move forward, then we have more realistic ideas of where we're going to get concentrations, when projects might be sequencing. And so as these applications move forward, making sure we have a robust um, cumulative impacts analysis, looking something at them, especially construction impacts, those temporary, whether it's noise, air quality, traffic. And so then as we see these project proposals, then we can do that more focused analysis in a given area. Once we know there are is potential for projects um, to overlap or maybe be concentration where you have two, three, four, projects may be in a vicinity but until those proposals come forward we it's it's really hypothetical and challenging to analyze mm -hmm. okay and then one final question in terms of the EIR and wildfire uh, is certainly it was identified as a serious risk and it was unavoidable uh, given the level of development does the EIR include how that then changes everything else so if, as an example, um, if there's tremendous wildfire risk, one of the things that could be decided is no more development in a certain part of the city. If that happened, then that would have a major impact on lots of other aspects of city life. So where does that secondary come in? Sure. Um, so you're, you're, the EIR, uh, is required to analyze the potential impacts of the proposed project. And if we proposed any mitigation measures, it would be required to analyze the impacts of those mitigation measures as well. So um, the EIR um, could, in theory, have identified that a mitigation measure for this potential wildfire hazard, which um, in, you know increases wildfire risk by allowing um, development to uh, continue to exist in the wildfire hazard zone in the western part of the city um, would be to to prohibit any development. So, for example, no more additions. No, if if a, if a house you know falls down and can't be rebuilt, um, and so to eliminate any development within the wildfire hazard zone would be an example of a mitigation measure that we could say, okay, this has addressed the wildfire risk but that might have other impacts as you're discussing. Um, we didn't really consider that to be a feasible mitigation measure, uh, and so we didn't discuss it or analyze the potential impacts of that mitigation measure in the EIR. Okay. But certainly if that was a step that the city wanted to take, that would probably be something that would require some additional analysis. Okay. And I think one of the things that this um, finding and the, the significant unavoidable impact highlights is really the changing nature of our urban wildland interface and the wildfire risk that is present that we're aware of that um, we maybe weren't five or ten years ago. And so there are various ways to help address it, whether that's um, working with properties in these high, very high fire hazard severity zones to when an additional remodel project comes in, um, we are working with them um, to establish defensible space. Um, ensuring that they meet minimum exterior fire resistant materials and installation of a class A roof. So there's other ways to harden properties and make them more resistant or defensible against wildfire risk. But this is acknowledging that we have a built environment that in includes areas in this very higher fire 
Verity zoning. So unless we're looking to take the step where we're functionally abandoning these properties and turning them back into the wildland, um, we have to acknowledge that it's a significant and unavoidable impact. Great, thank you. Those are my questions. So um, if we don't have other questions at the moment, then uh, why don't we open it up for public comment? Thank you. If you're in the audience in the council chambers and you're intending to comment on this item, if you could please bring up your speaker slips now. And um, our first speaker will be Ken Abreu. Good evening and uh, thank you. Uh, I'll be making my comments based on the Sierra Club letter that we sent in early September and also as a 40 year resident. Uh, we had a number of comments in that letter and uh, one of the major areas was on um, greening the city, which really ties to this idea of conservation, open space, parks and recreation. And we see this general plan as a key opportunity to do that to really improve those areas and green this city. Everything from uh, you know, getting more parks, getting more open space, uh, improving the, the creeks, which are now mostly cement, into something more like a creek with a riparian area around it. And we had some specific comments in there on a couple of the uh, policies and goals to strengthen that, particularly in new developments like around Hillsdale, where it may be possible to, to redevelop that area and, and turn the creek back into a real creek with a riparian area, with parks and open space and so forth. Uh, this is also an opportunity to plant more trees uh, and to, to bring about uh, a number of different ways of, of, of making the city a more pleasant place to live. Now, one of the other points we make in that letter regarding this area is that, you know, it's great, but where are you gonna get the land to do this? We only have the land that we have. And one of the, the points we make is in a related area that being able to add that new development in the city in a way that ha uses higher height, uh, like the height uh, going up to 12 stories will open up more space on the ground for doing these things. An example of that or a test case or scenarios was in the, the uh, uh, Hillsdale models where they were looking at uh, three different scenarios and with the higher heights, that's where they were able to add more parks, where they were able to have more wider sidewalks for people to walk on, uh, more parks for uh, kids, mm -hmm. and renewing the um, creek and the, uh, and the uh, riparian area around it. So I think that's one of the places where you have to look at, if we wanna really provide more open space, parks, recreation, and uh, natural areas, we need to look at how do we take our, our future development and put it into areas where we can put more height. And of course, the key to that is, and I think the staff and, and consultants have done a really good job of that, good job of that, is identifying areas, limited areas, where you can do that, where it's near transportation and so forth, get the, get the development away from other areas and open up spaces for parks, uh, wider uh, open space, trees, and the like. Okay, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Lori Watanuki, followed by Lori Heider and then Lisa Vandevoort. Good evening, Deputy Mayor Diaz Nash and members of the City Council. My name is Lori Watanuki. We need more residential preservation and protections in the 2040 General Plan. In regards to community design, we'd like to see a smaller downtown, historically preserved, pedestrian scale with suburban-like qualities, more like a Menlo Park um, or San Carlos or Los Altos versus the San Francisco. We'd like to see moderate growth in the downtown versus maximum growth. We'd like to see two to four story buildings in the downtown since most are one to two stories. Please remove the reference to triplex, fourplex, apartments, and townhomes in residential low one and two. We want to preserve our pre-war homes and um, not encourage demolition of the vintage homes. We are in favor of neighborhood preservation. In regards to outdoor noise, the maximum growth alternative 
brings unacceptable traffic volumes, unacceptable traffic noise, and air quality that exceeds Bay Area thresh thresholds with maximum growth. We'd like to see moderate growth to help reduce the traffic volume and improve air quality. There are two neighborhoods in particular that will be heavily impacted. That will be Central and North Central um, in Area 4. We need a feasibility study and funding for an 18-foot sound wall with dense plantings along 101. North Central, Central, and Sunny Bray uh, feel the impacts today. And this would help address freeway noise impacts, diesel particulates, and toxic air contaminants. We've been waiting 30 years for an adequate sound wall. An industrial park for service business and warehouse businesses is needed in San Mateo near 101 and 92. I noticed recently there were, um, well, I'll, go, I'll come back to that, but the large truck access to South Amphlet is very difficult because our streets are very narrow. And we do have additional impacts of diesel pollution, noise, and truck vibrations over the last 60 years. We're what you call an equity priority neighborhood. We'd like to see five ton load limit signs to South Amphlet, Fifth and South Humboldt as well. And residential streets in Central have experienced truck impacts. And we'd like to see lighter truck weights. Use the state highways, which include 101, 92, El Camino Real, and reduce the health impacts and safety issues for residents, pedestrians, and the bicyclists. We support ADUs in residential neighborhoods, but not commercial ADUs. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Lori Heider, Heider and then um, Lisa Van de Voort. Thank you, good evening, uh, Mayor Diaz, Nash, and council members, I'm Lori Heater. 40 years in San Mateo and 40 years as an environmental consultant. Forgive me for speaking fast, there's a lot to cover because I'm going to represent San Mateo Heritage Alliance and talk about the historic resources and some of my key comments that I made in my written comments. Um, the reason that we included the city's preservation must be based on state sequin federal regulations is because we have a planning commissioner who repeatedly tries to redo the definition of historic resources to meet her own agenda. And I think the more we can codify in the general plan, the easier it'll be going forward. Uh, the next thing is contributors to historic districts. It's a complicated topic. Historic districts generally don't have a lot of eligible properties. We have 444 properties in Baywood and only about 25 are individually eligible. So what we're trying to do is protect the district as a whole. And I think the city should protect all districts as a whole. But the only way you can do that is to have some protections for the contributors. Because the historic district is the historic resource. And if you don't call out contributors, they won't be treated as an historic resource. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think that's a really important aspect to preserving the look of an historic district, whether it's downtown or in Baywood or somewhere else. Um, so I think it, it's really important to include the term contributors. I wanted to point out that the protection for contributors in historic districts was actually in the existing general plan and in the um, historic resources ordinance and I'm not sure why it was taken out. Um, Christina mentioned wanting to be consistent treating the districts and the resources across the city, so I request that you put that term contributors back into all of the policies and especially to the demolition uh, discussion. And last, uh, we request that you revise the historic ordinance first before doing the context study or uh, conducting additional surveys. And I think it sounds like, Zach, you were talking about doing that, that the ordinance will start in January because we do have two new pending historic districts in San Mateo, both the um, Chico 107, Lendo 107 uh, Fifth Avenue and uh, the Baywood District, which um, 
may go forward in the next several months. So you received a lot of comments on protecting historic resources. I've gone through the comments uh, that were received on the general plan as well as the draft EIR. I think you received quite a few comments tonight. There are a few loud people who don't like historic resources, but it is a shared value at the state, national, and international level. So let's have San Mateo be a leader in preserving historic resources. Thank you. Thank you. And Lisa Van de Voort. Good evening, City Council, Mayor, and staff. My name is Lisa Van de Voort, and I'm a 30 year plus resident of San Mateo. I'd like to take the opportunity to speak tonight in defense of our city's historic resources. They can't speak, so I will. It is the city's responsibility to be the adult in the room and declare that historic resources are important to the city and must be identified and protected. And it's the city's responsibility to follow CEQA and identify and protect historic resources because it is the law and because it is the right thing to do for the future of the city. Kudos to the city staff that they are not recommending the Planning Commission's misguided input to delete the word eligible from, from the general plan's definition of historic resources, which is in clear violation of federal, state, and CEQA law. It is the responsibility of the city to defend its historic resources and, and its historic asset, assets and not kowtow to the activists on our Planning Commission or in our community. If the city decision makers don't value his, the city's historic assets, then who does and who will? To let historic resource protection degrade into a food fight between neighbors or, a, or as just a matter of opinion is an abdication of responsibility. The citizens of San Mateo do not wish to erase and replace their community contrary to the notion that reimagined San Mateo would have you, have you believe. If the city does not support protection of its community heritage and historic, historical resources or the value added benefit that they bring to the city we all live in, then the city of San Mateo is nothing more than a real estate development opportunity and we are all wasting our time. Many of our homes will soon be turning 100 years old. So let's all think about celebrating that as we envision general plan 2040. Thank you. Thank you, um, Madam Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor. Before I um, move on to remote comment, um, we do have 14 hands raised. Uh, there's a couple of things I need to put into place first, and we would like you to read the public comment portion of the script, the two paragraphs, sure. why we do that. We'll, we'll take a two-minute recess before moving to remote. Thank you.
I wanted to take the opportunity to reread the statement. It, we have one more public oh, in-house speaker, so if that would be okay if we yeah, could please, go ahead and absolutely. take absolutely. Cameron Rolf. Please, come on down. Hello. Every time I walk up to a microphone, poor Zach's fingers go into the desk and, and uh, Adam slaps his forehead and poor Rich goes, oh goodness, he's going to be here again talking to us. I, uh, 65 year resident in San Mateo, and I have only two questions. My first question is Zach knows exactly where I'm going to go with this. In fact, he should address you. My question is this. When they built Hillsdale and they added thousands of homes, our chief is gone. But we had a thousand of residents and not one dollar went to increase the staff of San Mateo police. They, in, they are response time for law enforcement went up. Construction developers and real estate people made millions and millions of dollars. They put it in their pocket and they gave zero back to the community. They build parks, but they won't pay for the staff to maintain them. We have to put that on our shoulders. They put streets in. Did they buy a new street sweeper to help? No, they didn't. These people who make millions and millions of dollars force us to support them. They force us to raise our utility rates so that we can electrify. And PG&E says if we keep this up right now, we're going to have more rolling blackouts. We're going to have more uh, uh, brownouts because we have to pay to electrify these new residents. When I was going to school in San Jose State, it was two lanes both directions on 101 with only Andrew Bushes in the middle. Now it's 12 lanes and it's still jammed. My question is this, who in the council here negotiates these, these uh, contracts with these people? And you should say, look, if you make millions and millions and millions of dollars, you should give chief a million dollars to hire more officers. In the last 10 years, his staffing has gone up zero. Our response time has gone up exponentially. We don't have an ambulance now. We share with Burlingame, with thousands of people being brought into San Mateo. How are we going to have ambulance service? Our streets aren't being swept because they add more streets, but they don't add the personnel. They should finance it. Golly, they make millions of dollars. The construction, the realtors, the developers make all this money. And nowhere in the contract does it say that we're going to build parks, but yet we're going to pay San Mateo from our huge profits to staff it. And my question is only this. I have been a resident of San Mateo for more than 65 years. Here's my question, and you can answer this for me. How will all of this enhance my life here in San Mateo? Go ahead. I'm sorry, we, we, we just take public testimony at this time. There's not a back and forth. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe the next time I come, you can stand up and explain how, how this enhances my life. Okay, thank you very much for listening to me. And please negotiate contracts so they will pay some of this and not us. I'm tired Thank of you. supporting these. Thank you very much. Okay, our, go ahead, madam. Okay, so we're going to go to the virtual public comment. But before we do, I want to reread uh, the comment about public comment. Members of the public wishing to comment on any item not appearing on the agenda may address the city council at this time. State law prevents council from taking action on any matter not on the agenda. Your comments may be referred to staff for follow-up. Also, one more note, we welcome speakers providing public comment, but please be advised this is a limited public forum. As such, speakers must stay on topic if speaking to a particular agenda item and if speaking during general public comment, they must address matters within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city. If speakers fail to follow these rules, they will be warned, and if they continue to disregard our rules, their opportunity to speak will be ended. 
Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, our first speaker remote is um, Dave Cohen. Please go ahead, Dave. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council members and staff. I'm Dave Cohen. Once again, I'm representing Ethics San Mateo, a California nonprofit benefit, public benefit corporation. And as ESM, as an organization, is issue agnostic, I want to make this clear. We don't support or oppose any of the specific staff recommendations, commission, or public inputs on the general plan. However, we believe that members of the Planning Commission are working in conflict with the requirements to be fair and impartial. That should be of significant concern to the Council and to the residents of San Mateo. We are continuing our investigations into potentially unethical conduct by certain Planning Commissioners and will release a statement of position after we look at all the evidence, evaluate it, find what is factual and not factual, and come to an opinion. We will, once this is done, we'll release a statement of position. However, in the meantime, we urge the council to scrutinize the items in the staff report, especially those coming from the planning commission or commissioners to make sure that they are fair and unbiased and we have an unbiased, fair process. That's all we ask for is ethical conduct. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Michael Weinauer. Please go ahead, Michael. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the, of the council. Thank you for your time. I'm sorry, Michael, go ahead again. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, um, Madam okay. Deputy Mayor, mem members of the council, thank you for your time tonight. Um, I, I echo a lot of the sentiments of the gentleman that spoke the last one live before Mr. Cohen, um, in that this plan, um, you know, with respect, Deputy Mayor, um, the, the plan is rife with contradictions, incongruities, and gaps like police response times. Um, and I have to respectfully disagree that the community is lining up behind this plan. And this isn't a knock on staff and their heroic efforts, frankly. Many of us feel this plan is being foisted on us and versus being met halfway with real compromise. And it's Christmas for developers. Um, I'm going to hit a few points. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on circulation because uh, the fifth and ninth arterials, we talked about that. But I'm telling you, um, that came up a lot in the last uh, in the, the District 3 meeting. You've heard a lot of comments tonight. We need commitment on dates when PW will revisit this policy with transparency. We need to understand who put this in place and how can we potentially unwind it. And we need commitment to implementing traffic calming on 5th and 9th and any arterials where needed, current or future. Uh, Kiku Crossing in this garage will be open imminently and those hundreds of cars are going to go right down 5th. Um, and frankly, a lot of residents don't trust the council and don't trust Public Works or the city in general. Um, for example, they widen 5th uh, against Complete Streets and Vision Zero. Uh, so there's a lack of trust there. We need to know that this is not going to happen. And in fact, we're going to go the other way with regard to noise. Um, I can't see the clock by the way, so I have no idea how much time I have, uh, the noise, the draft EIR gives the very serious designation of significant and unavoidable to air quality noise and wildfire. Uh, and it also opens up the city to lawsuits by not submit sufficiently mitigating and reduces the likelihood that the 2024 ballot measure will pass. Um, in other words, already noisy neighborhoods will be subject to significantly worse noise along with air quality wildfire and very notably missing and ignored by the GPEIR, water. A more moderate development path should be seriously considered, especially given arena flaws and population decreases, et cetera, et cetera. The council should seriously consider revisiting the land use map and reducing heights near neighborhoods in historic downtown. You saw the resident at the D3, or some of you did at the D3 meeting, who asked the audience to raise their hands for two to four stories versus four to 12. Everyone raised their hands for the former while only two for the latter. And that was about 25, 30 people. That is how most residents feel. Not this stuff about most residents wanting taller buildings. They just don't. And you have the most statistically significant survey you could ask for, the 2020 ballot where Measure Y received over 22,000 votes. That's better than any survey. And we could put that money towards, say, flood protection. Um, real quickly, historical assets, we need to understand what we have. And I'm reminded of Churchill when it was suggested that arts funding be cut because of World War II. And his response was, then what are we fighting for? I would argue the same applies to our irreplaceable historic assets. San Mateo is the Goldilocks of cities. And so many of us, myself included, move here for precisely that reason. Thank and you, lastly, 
Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dennis. Dennis, please go ahead. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Is this public comment not on the agenda items? This is this is for the general plan. So this isn't the time to ask why we tolerate juice second baby penis at gtvflyers.com? I'm sorry, sir. Um, I need to read. We welcome public speakers providing public comment, but please be advised this is a limited public forum. As such, speakers must stay on topic if speaking to a particular agenda item. And if speaking during general public comment, they must address matters within the subject matter jurisdiction okay. of the city. So I, are you going to speak about the general plan? Thank you, I'm removing you from this meeting. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Michael. Michael, please go ahead. Yes, hello. <clears throat> My name is Michael. I'm a resident of San Mateo. I'm um, speaking about several things. I have entered these comments into the into the general plan. I support the historical development and the de designation of historic neighborhoods because San Mateo needs to do everything it can to protect the beauty of the neighborhoods and the gardens that exist. And I say that because there is so much of San Mateo that is unattractive. The entrance into San Mateo, particularly from the south along El Camino Real is a disgrace. It's a mixture of used car dealers, shuttered stores, ugly restaurants, and there is no median with plants on it such there as there is in Menlo Park in Palo Alto. I realize El Camino Real is a state highway, but this is where um, your political skills and experience in working with other agencies is supposed to come into effect. In addition to that entrance, downtown San Mateo is not anything that anyone would call charming. It's ugly. There's obviously there were no standards when it was when it, the stores were allowed. There's no requirement for people to keep their storefronts clean. And there's now an ugly vacant lot with a fence around it, another concession to developers, as was mentioned earlier. So I would support anything that could be done to keep, uh, keep the downtown attractive. In addition, the noise issues uh, exist. The, the use of gas leaf blowers and lawnmowers it was not addressed by the council, including by our supposedly public health professional mayor, um, none of you did anything to uh, address that problem. And the Public Works Department is still not addressing issues of speeding and loud traffic, including uh, in, despite efforts such as Mr. Reagan has mentioned, as I have tried to work with the Public Works for over a year and received no response, even when I copied our vice mayor. Thank you, issue. Michael. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Mike. Mike, please go ahead. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So about the general plan, uh, is this something like uh, the agenda 2030 that all these kikes be pushing? Does that have anything to do with it? You know. We ask that you stay on topic, and because you are not, I am going to be removing you from this meeting. Thank you. Uh, I'll stay on topic. Let me finish my uh, my comment, my public comment. Hey, quit unmuting me, you fuck, you fucking whore. I'm Mike Shitwood. You can't mute me. I beg to differ. <laughs> Okay, uh, next speaker is Carl. Carl, please go ahead. Yes, hello. Yes, we can hear you. It's Carl Childers here at Benton. 
And I want to say, this town is full of niggers and kikes. It's terrible. Can't Thank you. I'm removing you from the meeting. Our next speaker, I will allow to talk in just a moment, but I want to remind everyone we are to stay on topic with the general plan. Profanity will not be um, listened to. We have a policy regarding that. The next speaker is Judy. I think it bounced to the bottom. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Sarah. Sarah, please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, uh, real quick, I want to remind the board members that the Brown Act requires the public's business to be conducted in open and public meetings and recognizes the right of the public to participate in said meetings. The Brown Act specifically states that a legislative body may not prohibit public criticism of the policies, procedures, programs, or services of the agency or of the acts or omissions of the legislative body. With that being said, it's not okay for members of the legislative body to silence or stifle comments about certain groups of people that are of concern to the public, particularly niggers and Jews. Thank you. We ask you to stay on topic to the general plan. Oh, you, you want me to keep talking about how niggers and Jews? Thank you. It is our policy to um, end public comment when you're verging off off topic and into um, speech that is um, not appropriate for this dignity of this meeting. Thank you. We'll go to the next speaker. Nick, please go ahead. Nick. Seems that um, you've decided not to talk. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is James. James, please go ahead. Hi, can you guys hear me all right? Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, it has been an interesting night. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of pick up where I left off a little earlier. Um, I I wrote this into the clerk um, email earlier today, but I wanted to provide some general comment on that 2040 city plan, particularly just around the noise. Um, and apologies if some of this is duplicate uh, just from earlier. Uh, but my wife and I do live along B Street, along the section that's not without, and there's no traffic lights between 9th and 5th. And I've heard a lot talked about 9th and 5th tonight. I actually didn't realize they were being considered an arterial um, recently. So, uh, but because of the larger street size on B Street as well, and that access to those two streets, we have experienced a lot of noise due to loud cars and particularly these Harley Davidson motorcycles as well that kind of race up and down the street, particularly late at night. Um, I've actually been in contact with local law enforcement on the issue. I ran into somebody just the other day and I was able to share um, a, a Google Drive link with some footage that I've recorded of some of this activity, some of this behavior that is just not safe uh, to, to experience and witness. It's just a lot of bad behavior from repeat offenders. And we basically called uh, this section of B Street the San Mateo Speedway at this point. Um, so my intention for this isn't really just to attack certain individuals or businesses or anything, but it's more just in a hope to affect some change in the way that hopefully this section of San Mateo is designed going forward. Given that there's a lot of pedestrian traffic through here with a lot more on the way, I know that there's another uh, project in, in play just across the way over at uh, Kelly Moore Paints, where that is currently today. Um, placing uh, painted sidewalks and cross or painted crosswalks is not really going to stop this kind of behavior um, through here. I mean, noise is just going to increase, safety will decrease. It's just not a good situation. So I, I think we need to focus on uh, including this section of B Street as well uh, with, with traffic calming measures that's been discussed elsewhere. Um, just to basically prevent the desire to speed and to rev the loud engines in the first place. Uh, sending officers out to ticket cars and patrol sidewalks isn't really sustainable. It's not really something we can do uh, going forward. Um, but taking simple measures like reducing like the street width sizes that's been mentioned elsewhere, trying to reduce the openness of the road 
Like it literally looks like an open racetrack when you're on that road. And I ride my bike a lot through there and it looks like it from a, from a bike. Um, my hope is to see permanent fixtures that slow or divert the traffic. Uh, things like tried and true city planning designs like raised intersections, um, you know, that slow cars um, that allow better accessibility access. Basically just putting people first instead of optimizing for the speed and size of cars that are just getting faster and larger. So um, hopefully, you know, with some taking some simple implementations of these designs, as soon as they're financially feasible, like with timing with like, you know, re, uh, construction projects or repaving, I think that that's, that's not a difficult thing to include as part of a city plan. And I think it would drastically increase uh, the quality of life for those of us who live here. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our um, next speaker, uh, we have... Let's see, 10 remaining speakers. The last speaker will be Jordan Grimes. Um, our next speaker it, um, is George. Uh, George, in just a moment, um, I will allow you to talk. I want to remind everyone to stay on topic and uh, not to use uh, derogatory or hate speech. We um, are maintaining the civility in the city council room. So please stay on topic for the general plan. Please go ahead, George. Uh, yes, hi. Um, uh, first comment, I was wondering if, um, that, that's the first time I've heard that kind of disgusting commentary on, on the, one of these meetings. Maybe this is a thing now, but maybe somebody in the council or on, on the, in the room there at the end can explain what's going on because this sounds like some kind of coordinated effort by hooligans, to put, it, put it mild, put it nicely. Um, then my own comment, um, I am wondering where is the equity and where is the fairness in providing open space and green space in certain parts of the city and not in others? And ask yourselves, why is it so predictable that the high density city style infrastructure packaged along with exurban low level services is being crammed into the already struggling, already crowded, you know, neighborhoods of the city, the, the neighborhoods of color, essentially, for the most part. And um, and there's no open space to go alongside. I was rather shocked to hear the gentleman from the Sierra Club um, essentially engaged in casual racism by saying, let's stick uh, these, these uh, difficult, uh, these uh, underserved infrastructure buildings, these high density buildings in certain neighborhoods so the rest of the city can live well. If you're going to be doing high density um, city style infrastructure, you should be increasing services in that area by a level of 10, by an order of magnitude. You can't just, you know, take away the space, add to the, to the complexity of the neighborhood, add, you know, already crowded neighborhoods, and then say, let's stick a park somewhere else where people can enjoy it who don't have to deal with any of that other stuff. That's really just patently unfair, patently unequitable. And you really have to look yourselves in the mirror and say, hmm, why is it so easy for me to do something like this to the people that you live there? All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and our next speaker will be Jude. Jude, please go ahead and remind her to stay on topic. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, uh, I'm glad that the uh, previous caller brought up equity. I'd just like to read something real quick. Diversity means fewer white people. In inclusion means exclusion of white people. Equity means stealing from white people. Um, I hear us talking about the general plan and how we're going to clean up the city and make it safer. Uh, I think the way to do that is demographically, you know, because some of these people that we are importing, these invaders that are coming here and the, the people that we're importing, Back home where they're from, they get Thank you. Well, you're not staying on topic. On we road, will remove you now. Okay. Our next speaker is Guitar. I hate niggers and I hate you. I am removing you um, from this meeting for not staying on topic.
Okay, our next speaker is Paul Miller. Paul, please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your time. I'd like to speak on the issue of violent crime. So our city has been facing... It's not that's not on topic. Mr. Miller, you have been removed. Thank you. Next speaker, one moment, please, while I reset the clock. It's Mr. Leonard Frank. Hello, City Council. Um, quick question before I begin. Is this on the 2030 or the 2040 general plan, or is it a mixture of both? Just for clarification, thank you. Okay, I got no replies, so I'm going to assume it's on both. I think that the infrastructure plans going forward are actually a great boon for our city, but um, a few callers ago, somebody mentioned accessibility. My aunt herself is in a wheelchair, and that's a big thing we're struggling with right now, is wheelchair accessible public spaces and things like that. I mean, we got all these speed bumps in the road and our economic development and all of our infrastructure and things like that. And accessibility is something that's very important to me, very dear to my heart. Like, for example, why is our nation so accessible to niggers, kikes, and Jews, all these beaners, and all these immigrants, these foreign invaders? They shouldn't be here. They need to go back. You are not staying on topic. You are removed from the meeting. Our next speaker is um, Jim Conley. Please go ahead. Jews did 9-11. Thank you. Have a good night. Okay. Our next speaker is Jenna. Jenna, go ahead, please. I think there would be much more money in every city budget if all of our cities weren't filled with and housing illegal aliens. Thank you. Out. This You are not staying on topic. You are being removed from the meeting. Thank you. Our next speaker is Randy Fine. Go ahead, please. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, I wanted to bring up the uh, aspect in the general plan um, conservation. I think it's probably one of the most important on the list, keeping our, our parks and recreations you know, up to date, clean, and, and it also gives people jobs. So, I mean, we need more of that. We need more management in our parks. And uh, on the aspect of the safety, I, I think in order to keep the city safety, we got to get rid of all the niggers and the kikes. Mm -hmm. it's our last and final speaker is Jordan Grimes. One moment. Jordan, I'll unmute you. Go ahead, please. Good evening, Council. Jordan Grimes, lifelong San Mateo resident. I just want to briefly offer a note of thanks to Clerk Olds for her deft handling of the abhorrent and racist and anti-Semitic Zoom bombers. It was greatly appreciated by the rest of the community. To the topic at hand, um, given some of the earlier comments, I do want to say that, in my view, it would be, frankly, a travesty if our downtown and surrounding area was zoned for anything less than 10 stories going forward in the coming years. We have a housing crisis that grows worse and worse every day, and we need to utilize the land we do have to its highest and best use, especially in areas close to transit. Myself and other local advocates remain extremely concerned about the weaponization of historical preservation as a tactic by NIMBY elements in districts one, three, and five in order to prevent the construction of badly needed multifamily housing in San Mateo, having the effect purposefully or otherwise, of perpetuating and entrenching racial and socioeconomic segregation in some of the city's most affluent and homogenous neighborhoods. In that vein, I want to strongly support the Planning Commission recommendations around more equitable historic preservation policies, particularly removing eligible definition of historic resources in CD 5.3. I also want to support the ask others have made to halt the establishment of new historic districts. 
Despite claims to the contrary, there is absolutely no evidence to support uh, the idea that historic preservation is even on the minds of everyday San Mateans, let alone an issue people care about strongly, especially the 48% of the city that rents every day and is struggling with high housing prices. San Mateo faces an extreme shortage of new housing, faces unaffordability challenges, faces the climate crisis. We should focus on those. Let's embrace the future, not the past, and create a more modern, equitable city where all can thrive. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Our last speaker was listed as Jordan Grimes. So Jordan um, has just completed the last speaking position. Any uh, other hands being raised at this time? We are not going to be taking further comment as we have completed our public comment portion of the general plan. And I believe um, Madam Deputy Mayor has a statement, a statement to read. Yes. I would like to say on behalf of the city council, on behalf of the city staff, on behalf of all city residents, visitors, businesses, and anyone who loves San Mateo. We all in the city of San Mateo condemn hateful, anti-Semitic, and racist speech in the strongest possible terms. At a time of rising anti-Semitism and hate speech, we will not stand for it. Hate speech has real life consequences. Our country has had numerous mass shooting events, including at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando in 2016, the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh in 2018, and the Poe Shabbat in 2019. We in San Mateo embrace the rights of all individuals in our community and other communities to be who they are in terms of their sexuality, gender, religious orientation, beliefs, ethnicity, and we will always do so no matter what. Thank you. So now let's get back to the business at hand. We've closed public comment. Thank you for all the people who made relevant comments. And I want to bring it back to the council for discussion. Who would like to start us off? Council Member Lorraine, thank you very much. Thank you. So I think on a high level, um, I appreciate uh, and support all of staff's recommendations with regard to uh, changes to the draft general plan and, and the elements we're discussing tonight. Um, that might seem like a, a rather basic statement, uh, but I, I appreciate that the recommendations that are made are, are being made from a variety of sources, um, from a number of opportunities to get outreach from uh, members of our community, from uh, nonprofit organizations, uh, and from our uh, other uh, commission uh, and, our, and our general plan subcommittee, uh, composed of a number of individuals who have spent quite a bit of time poring over uh, the, the documents and the work that has been done to date. Um, so I, I actually think uh, I'm, I'm pleased to see uh, the variety and, and I agree with uh, a lot of the proposed changes and I appreciate seeing them uh, listed in staff's recommendations. So, um, you know, I, I, do, I do also like this note that came from General Plan Subcommittee that was not included uh, to add policies and our actions to support the expansion of cultural and entertainment resources in San Mateo under conservation, open space, parks and rec. I, I, I will concede though that I may not be ready at this moment to uh, contextualize it further and, and, and maybe make, uh, turn it into a specific action or goal. Um, 
And I suspect that, of course, we, you know, this, this is not necessarily an anathema to, to a number of goals, policies, and actions that are likely currently in the general plan. Um, so uh, I suppose I'll, I'll have to chew on it. And uh, if other members of, of the council have uh, suggestions uh, toward that, I, I may be interested in supporting them uh, to, to perhaps get that onto the list in, in some meaningful way. Um, or I can uh, consider, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that, that, that might be an okay place for me to start. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilmember Hedges. So um, with community design and historic resources, uh, I generally support the concept my family goes back to 1670 in this country. Still many old standing homes, some from the 1700s. And so uh, I think it's important to have historic uh, context to our city. But I was a little surprised that only 25 homes in Baywood are part of the 445 that are significantly historical. I think that was from a public comment. So I think I'm quoting it right. If I'm not somebody, please correct me. So I'm interested in the concept of contributors, but I think they have to actually have a direct contribution. So I think the jury's still out with me on that, but I could lean toward it, uh, having it a, uh, a portion of the historic resources. But again, I was kind of smitten by the fact that there's so few houses and what these contributors would actually contribute, I do not know. So. Uh, We'll go forward with that and hopefully it'll become clear to me and everybody else is exactly what this, this all means for the historic resources of our city. Um, with the, uh, uh, I support uh, the, the staff's uh, direction on conservation, open space and park and parks elements. Obviously we need more, more parks, but where do we get that, uh, that land? We have very few unless you go across J. Hart Clinton Drive on the east side, uh, and very small. So uh, we need to take a look at that and how we can make it go forward, but probably pretty much impossible based on the land available. Um, noise element, I think, is very important. I, th I agree with staff on that. I pretty much agree with and support the staff's recommendations and revisions of each element, and uh, I also uh, Uh, think that we should uh, we should look into cultural and entertainment uh, uh, venues in the city a little more strongly. Let me tell you why. Uh, we're really redeveloping portions of the downtown. We hope to bring in young people because they're the future of the city uh, over the long term. And what we're going to need downtown is venues for those young people to feel like they have a nightlife. And if they don't, we won't retain them. And we, we need them in several ways. We have a new business that has 1,000 employees in one of Wendy Hill's buildings. We need them to staff these new jobs we have. We have a lot of needs for them, so we have to find ways to keep them here. And I think culture and entertainment resources, especially downtown, is very important. So let me think. I think that's it for me right now. If you have any questions, of what I've said, please ask. Councilmember Newsom. Patrice, you're a rock star. Thank you for standing up to racist bigots and terrible people. And it definitely was a distraction, but I think as a team we've we've pulled through. And thank you for everyone for their patience and putting up with that unacceptable behavior. Uh, Community design, uh, it totally has me silent. Community design and historic resource elements. Um, I think I, I also would like to know more about this. Um, I, I've had many conversations with people who are both for and, and against the historic uh, districts. Um, I think it, 
for now is key that we do leave the contributor piece in. And I think what we should do is kind of what I think you've suggested, which is let the state and federal resources play through first and then come back and evaluate, you know, if that is what, in fact, those communities want. Um, yeah, sorry, do you have? Sorry, just a, a quick clarification. Eligible was the piece we were recommending to stay in. Contributor was one we would look, there is, has been requests to add it, but we would look for um, council guidance on that before we add further references to it. So the eligible was the, is the one that exists in there that we are recommending okay. remain. Well, I'd like to maintain eligible and I'd like to have a better understanding of what a contributor is. Um, and I know we don't have to decide on today, so I won't, but if we could get a better understanding of what it means to have you know, 380 contributor homes and 200 or 25 um, eligible homes. Like it would, it'd be good to have some understanding of that. Um, I'm definitely in the alignment with everyone as far as conservation, open space, and the parks element. Uh, I think you know, as we continue to develop neighborhoods, we want to make sure that we're finding even micro parks. Um, some of our newer developments have those types of resources with more you know, promenades and just kind of open outdoor space. It's also important as we move into higher, higher buildings that you know, we're, we're gaining some of that back uh, on the ground. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't really help us in our older neighborhoods because most of our older neighborhoods are, are not gonna be you know, tearing down blocks of, of homes, so it doesn't really open that up for, for much, but I think it's important that we do you know, to look at that and, and preserving open space and, and, and adding parks if possible to whatever extent possible. Um, also very concerned about the noise element. I've heard different, mostly public comments saying that some of the noise uh, ratios are, are much higher than should be. And, and so I'd like going forward to have a better understanding of, you know, what, what is an acceptable decibel level of noise you know, based on the development and how do we maintain, um, you know, safe noise in neighborhoods. Uh, I did hear one of my neighbors and would be interested in, you know, things like sound walls around train tracks and around freeways. I think sound walls could also contribute to uh, reducing the amount of, you know, of pollutants and, and improving the air quality, at least giving us a little bit of barrier. Uh, so interested in that. Uh, overall, I think I support most of the, uh, I think I support all the staff recommendations uh, for the elements. Um, don't think I have anything else to add, but uh, maybe when I hear the last of the public comment, I might. Thank you. Council Member Lorraine. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I just wanted to add a, a short note based on uh, the comments of my colleagues. I, I just want to echo, I, I, I too support keeping the, the eligible um, word in, in the language that we, we currently have with regard to historical resources. And um, I, you know, I, I feel I also am interested in learning more about contributors and uh, I, I think it might make sense to uh, defer to the upcoming continued work in uh, that, that staff has described that will be begin next year. And, and I, I, I feel like these comments are, are related in that overall, I feel that uh, I'd like to engage in, in uh, uh, this, this process of better fleshing out the city's uh, policies, you know, local position on uh, how to, I think, conform with state and federal laws uh, while maintaining uh, discretion and, and understanding you know, in, in which ways uh, we, we may have discretion and, and how it would fit within the overall picture of the general plan. So um, I feel like going ahead with staff's recommendations at this time uh, is congruent with that and, and I'm comfortable. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, I left something out as well. Thank you for reminding me, Adam. I want to keep the word eligible as also. So there's three of us. Any other comments? No? Um, okay, well, thank you all for that. I've got a couple of miscellaneous things to start off with. 
Um, number one, thank you to staff here who've done it before. This is a, a work beyond of love. So it's uh, really appreciated and really appreciate the community's involvement because this can't be a successful plan if we don't have community engagement. And I've actually been surprised and pleasantly surprised at the increasing amount of engagement that we've had. I think in particular having the most recent five town halls has been very important and I've seen a lot of people coming together and discussing different ideas and, and learning and educating themselves, which is what's so important. Um, and there were a lot of new people there too. It wasn't just the same five people who show up at every meeting, and I think that was staff's goal, so I think that's a very important thing to acknowledge. Um, moving on, and I think this should never stop, this process, um, from that perspective. But moving on, uh, the comment that first Councilmember Lorraine made about um, increasing and really being specific about enhancing our culture and entertainment. I was actually the one who brought that up originally on the general plan subcommittee. And I did that because I think it's critical and Councilmember Hedges mentioned it at one point to have this in order to create community. As we grow, as we become more diverse, as we gain more people coming from the outside or people who haven't lived there all their lives, we need to create a community. And that is what culture and entertainment does. And we've seen that already down on B Street, Fall Fest last weekend. People come together, they learn about each other, they become a community. Movies, music in the park, all of this is so important. And staff has done what they can, but I think there has to be a, a sizable investment by the city, by the Chamber of Commerce, by the DSMA, by other groups to come together and really make this something because we all want San Mateo to be where you want to be, whether you're a business person, a visitor, a resident, and that is so critical to make that happen. So I believe that has to be called out in the general plan and needs to be implemented as well. Um, so that was just a little bit of clarification. In terms of uh, some of the comments that we've received from the public, there was an email that came in today from Build Up San Mateo County and Four Seas of San Mateo County about really beefing up the discussion of childcare in our general plan. And I 150% support this, and I believe staff is already thinking about it, but I encourage you to do even more because all these things we want to do with our city, we need to be able to have sufficient affordable child care to do that. Uh, I also would encourage, I know the staff is working very hard on how do we spotlight our seniors more. I think we need to do that even more specifically in the general plan. And I'd love to see how that's gonna to come together because as I've said before, it's our fastest growing segment and we need to make it not just a resource that we take care of, but a resource that is vital and contributing back to our city as we all want to have happen. Um, I appreciate the comments made by Martin Wiggins about studying the feasibility of studying air pollution mitigation near highways, particularly in areas, areas where we're planning new housing. That's a lot of studying and I leave it to the experts to see what can be done. But obviously we wanna build healthy, strong communities for everybody in San Mateo. Um, I think the comments that were made and echoed by Councilmember Newsom about really looking at how we can use man-made infrastructure like sound walls and different things to try and mitigate the noise and the pollution. If it's going to come, we need to do everything in our power to try and mitigate it and keep it away from the vibrancy of our, our city. Um, then moving on to, and I support much of what the staff has recommended, and really focusing on the you know wildfire and noise. And while it's something that may be something we have to deal with and mitigate with, we need to think about how to educate as well. And I think education, maybe it's somewhere else, not in the general plan, but it needs to be something that we focus on a great deal. When it comes to community design and historic resources, I appreciate staff's recommendations. Um, I also want to draw 
people's attention to the city's historic resources page on the website, which is going to be expanded. And I think it's very important that the city continue to do more in the coming year about educating people and inviting comment. But I also think it's very important to say that we are San Mateo and people love San Mateo because of, partially because of our historic resources. And it means different things to different people in different part of, parts of the city. I applaud the city's efforts to try and create a fundamental equal a standard process so everyone who is interested in learning or becoming active in preserving historic resources has the opportunity to and it is considered an important part of our city process. Um, I think that there is obviously some education that needs to be had in conversation about historic districts and what they are made up of. But the way I understand it, and let me include this in the conversation, is that when you look at a neighborhood, whether it's Central, whether it's North Central, whether it's Beresford, whether it's Baywood, whether it's Shoreview, there is a feel of that neighborhood. And part of the feel of that neighborhood is natural. It's because it's on the bay. It's because it's up in the mountains. It's because it's that it's been around for a while, but it's also because of the elements and the resources that are in that community. And some of them, as we've talked about, are individually eligible. They check the box of all the things, whether it be a famous person lived there, or they were part of a trend, or whatever it happens to be that makes them individually qualified. But a neighborhood or a potential historic district is also made up of um, resources, buildings that might not be 100% qualified, but they contribute to that feel of when you walk through North Central, or you walk through Central, or you walk along the shore, what it means. So I very much would like to see contributors called out as part of the general plan. We need to have lots of discussions about how does the city implement the policies of the general plan, and we need to have a lot of community discussion about what that means for historic resources. But I think it's important at this level to acknowledge the value of contributors in achieving the entire feel of a neighborhood. So I, I don't agree with just focusing on eligible. I think eligible is very important. But in order to create that general feeling of a neighborhood, you need to include contributors as well. And I think the important thing next year is for us to understand what that means and where the city wants to implement its, its regulations. Um, so I would recommend adding in conformance with state and federal laws and CEQA throughout the historic resource section. I would add uh, contributing properties to eligible historic districts wherever it is appropriate in the document. And um, when we get down to what does this mean for our city, I would recommend that we do a strong education effort before we get into a lot of the detail of what do people want, because obviously we need, to, we need that. Everyone needs to have a common understanding and a common set of facts. I also really um, would appreciate retaining the respecting existing rhythm and scale commentary in the historic resource and uh, community design section because I think it's important to say we want, whether it's downtown, Glazenwood, you know, wherever it is, to when there is new development, that it respects what is there so that we can grow together. I'm all for innovation. I want to try new different things, but we need to respect and echo what is already here. So um, I think those are my comments. But just once again, I think the behavior of our participants from the audience tonight, from the staff, from the city council, I just want to say thank you because I think we've demonstrated tonight through some fairly rough patches what being an, a wonderful community is all about. So I just really want to respect and honor everyone who's been part of that for past, present, and future efforts and say I want, I want this general plan 
to reflect that feeling in words, what we just demonstrated tonight in our actions and in our feelings. So thank you. So I guess we have to ask you, uh, Zach, what, what questions do you have? What further clarifications do you need? Um, so I, I believe I heard from all four of you on the G GPS recommendation about kind of enhancing these cultural entertainment um, offerings and putting something in the conservation open space and recreation element. What we can do is work on drafting something like that and then maybe bring that back to kind of confirm so we, we're going in the right direction, but it, it mm -hmm. sounds like there's definite concurrence with adding something specific to that topic. Um, so we, we will work on that and bring that back at one of our next two meetings. With regard to contributor, I guess I would ask, is there, um, are there three members of the council that want to see that term added to the, the historic resources section or um, carried forward in the focus policy effort that um, we're shooting to kick off in the new year? I would say for now, I'd like it to be added. And, and obviously, I'd like it to be brought back with more so we have a better understanding of the differentials between what are contributors versus what, you know, I mean, I, I know what an eligible is, but what contributors are would be great. I want more information, uh, that's for sure. I am enamored, and enamored with historical districts, but I want to reserve rights, property rights of, of people in the district as well. So uh, I want to have a mix in this where everybody gets something. I would prefer to wait at this time uh, to add it until after we go through the staff process. Okay, we, we can hear that. And, and also just a reminder, the, the general plan is, all, is a living document and so it can evolve and grow and be amended as needed as these policy dialogues take place into the future. So any decision tonight, what goes into the general plan now, that doesn't mean that it's forever locked in place. And then um, there was also um, some comments about um, kind of this um, sound and pollution walls. I think we had a um, recommended, let me pull that up really quick. Um, air quality there, um, the air outdoor air quality mitigation, um, that's item ID six. Was the council looking to go further or were you voicing support for adding this, um, this new action in, um, under goal C COS 4? Go, go ahead. I think I need more clarification too. So. Yeah, I, I'm going to need a little. So as far as uh, pollution near freeways, um, just personal note, I have three blue air uh, uh, devices that clean the air in my house and any reputable developer can put HVAC systems that pulls most of that out of the air. The blue air that I have actually pulls virus and, 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 and bacteria out of the air. So there are ways to deal with it. We might want to be looking at that rather than stopping housing. Definitely. And so I, I think it, this could come up in a couple different ways for the, in the next two meetings, I think both within the land use context and with public services and facilities. This particular one under air quality was getting at outdoor spaces because I think the discussion was identifying there are ways to address indoor air quality, but the challenge was how do you provide outdoor usable space and then still mitigate the impact of, of air quality when you're close to a pollution source such as a highway. So um, based on that, that, we have this new action to kind of look at that further and so um, we would just ask where is this does this action kind of get to what you were interested in pursuing or do you want to see us work on developing an additional policy or action to kind of speak to this concept of noise and and air quality buffers uh, along our highway corridors Good question uh, so the highway sound walls are done by the state and I don't know that we have the resources to raise walls to 18 feet all around the freeways uh, in San Mateo. So is there any control we have over that would be my question. 
within the public right of way, it's limited. Obviously, we can yeah. engage with Caltrans, but it's their right of way. Um, I think there was some discussion about, say, a long amphlet where we have a right of way adjacent to it, looking at, I mean, and there was the concept of walls, but also dense vegetation, which has an ability to do some degree of, of pollutant reduction or catch some of those larger particles. Um, so there was a suggestion to where we have right of way adjacent. So that's land that's under the city's the control. Spaces along Amphlet and uh, on the other side of the freeway have been somewhat limited by the uh, uh, new express lanes. They've actually moved the sound walls in, uh, in uh, along uh, North Shoreview. They're taking all the parking spaces out along there. And one of the things we could do is, is maybe, because uh, we are looking at, at solutions such as walls and vegetation, so in a way, when we move forward under this action, we could kind of have that more focused discussion. So it sounds like maybe the, what you have been touching on is covered within this action. So um, if you're comfortable with that, we could take that feedback and, and identify that it would be kind of addressed at a future time under when we move forward with this action. Well, I can give you one uh, thing that we've done where I live. We're replacing old pines with redwood, which actually do a lot more cleaning the air than the other tree. So we can look at trees that do the best job in cleaning the air. Yeah, um, I would just like to add that I, I like COS4 and uh, I appreciate it being included here and I like that there may be uh, added utility that could uh, deter some, some noise impacts uh, with what is discussed here. So I appreciate that, thank you. Sorry, I, I kind of started this, so I'll try, I'll try to finish it. But uh, I mean, obviously, if the city doesn't have the funding for it, we're not going to be able to move forward with it. But that said, I don't think that prevents us from, from investigating and looking more into it. I also think that we should try to hold our partners like Caltrans and Caltrans uh, responsible as they, as they build out things to, to put more infrastructure in place. So, you know, as we continue to electrify the rail, like we should see if we can have them be doing, you know, adding adding sound barriers, adding vegetation to help reduce the pollutants. So I think that you know, there's no harm in, in saying that that's our intent. Is we want we'd like to try to make sure that as they expand, that they they provide that. We obviously have no teeth to enforce it, but I just think uh, from from an investigating it perspective, anything we can do to reduce you know noise and, and increase or or better our air quality is is important to our to our neighborhoods and i i didn't mean it as a uh, a, a wall versus housing i mean that's not something i envision at all i think they are they're not mutually exclusive we could be adding a sound wall as we build a new housing complex so that's my thoughts on that thank you Perfect. And I think the last one we would ask for clarification, there was a recommendation in the um, Heritage Alliance letter that asked about adding the reference to state and consistent with state and federal laws in CEQA within. The, um, the comprehensive approach to historic preservation was, um, is there council concurrence to add that to that definition? I'll just mention that I, I don't think it's necessary at this time. I personally think, uh, as I think was illuminated by the public comment, that um, it, it was trying to add clarity and context, but like in response to um, decisions uh, perhaps recommended by the Planning Commission. And, and I think, um, firstly, that the recommended changes by staff and the language therein effectively includes what is necessary for us to move forward. And uh, I, I am not worried about uh, a recommendation from Planning Commission uh, deterring us from our goals. Um, I'm going to jump in out of turn uh, because I was the, one of the people who was supporting this. I, this. I am not supporting it because of anything that happened on the Planning Commission. I'm supporting it because we need to be clear. And we all know, as you're, you know it, that you're going to do all of this as you're developing the general plan. But this is a document that's going to live for a very long time. And a lot of people won't know 
that we sat here and we assume certain things. So I think it's important to put it in the document. And if it's redundant, it's three or four words that are redundant, but I think it clarifies things and it's important. I think I'm fine with staff's recommendation as it's written. I agree with Adam. I think keeping it in and clarifying is important and we can always pull it back out later, but I think I would keep it in for now. Okay, so I, I have heard um, keeping the definition as, as drafted since it appears there was 2-2 two, two on that one. And then the last one, there was um, a mention of looking at the um, CD 8.3 um, and that it was respecting existing scale rhythm and then there was also the uh, keeping rhythm and scale in there is, there any position on whether to keep it as recommended or change it to pull those words back in or bring it back to its original form or some other version in between? Once again, since I was the one who was suggesting it, I think it's just important to talk about it, put it down existing scale and rhythm. I'm fine with the, you know, taking out the stepping back upper floors and the detail that absolutely should be in code when we develop it. But this, this document is all about saying what we want for the city. And we want to respect existing scale and rhythm. We can do very different things with it, but it's, it's, a, it's a design element that I think it's important to keep in. One suggestion, um, so in that, um, rather than the title, but if you look at and, and should incorporate architectural styles and elements that relate to the scale, rhythm, and design of the surrounding buildings, would that be a good way to fold it back in? I, I would just think that, so like when I read context-sensitive design, I don't understand that nearly as much as respect existing skill and rhythm. So I think having context sensitive design at the beginning is fine, but putting back in some of the verbiage to existing skill and rhythm is is kind of, it's, it's easier to understand. I mean, I, I get what that means versus, I, for me it's like almost, almost defining what context sensitive design is. Yeah, I don't, thanks. I like scale and rhythm. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I think the idea behind the changes that are being recommended is to, uh, you know, potentially to, to step back from being too specific uh, and, and instead allow uh, the continued work in the form of something such as the, the document we may get with the objective design standards to give some options that are context sensitive. <laughs> so I, I think I, I don't mind it. I, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I think, I, I feel like from what I recall, hearing and, and seeing, you know, in, in previous decision points that led us to this change recommendation, um, that, that I, I don't know, Zach, could you clarify that a little bit? I, I, I think it's, isn't it fair to say that the reason why this staff is recommending this is, is to step back from specificity and, and allow for future documents uh, to, to allow for, for options that are context specific? We were trying to calibrate based on feedback we'd received both as part of the general plan update process and objectors design standard process. But what I'm hearing, and, and I think it could still work, is if it almost reads, the title is respect existing scale and rhythm, starting with context sensitive design for new mixed use development should incorporate. So it's almost, I think, folding both pieces in. And I could even see it working with scale, rhythm, and design. So I mean, I guess maybe we're having both of it, uh, all of it there. Um, but I, I think we can work with either one, because I think these are terms used to inform our objective design standards. So I don't think we were trying to calibrate it, but 
I don't necessarily see any issue with keeping those other terms. And then I guess the last one, because it was a specific recommendation from the Planning Commission, was that last line about the stepping back for upper floors, whether that should stay or, or stay as a, or, or be removed. Thank you. I, I would, I would um, yeah, I feel more strongly about that recommendation. Um, and and I, I suppose uh, if, if there's an opportunity to compromise on on adding back the word rhythm uh, and and thereby having our cake and eating it too, I, I'm okay with that. So um, in terms of taking out the stepping back upper floors, that was suggested to be removed as, because it was too specific for the plan, but that it could go into other documents. Was that, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, I, I think the intent there was that doesn't mean that step backs couldn't be incorporated, but we didn't want to require every building to have a step back. Mm -hmm. And so it was saying maybe it doesn't need to be in the policy, but they, it can still exist in areas within the objective design standard. So I think yeah. that was the motivation is to avoid applying it to everything, yep. but still have it as a tool. Thank you. Isn't that something that the Planning Commission has the authority to recommend to the City Council anyway? I think we can get into it in more detail when the objective design standards move through um, both Planning Commission and then come before Council. Okay. But yeah, I, I think removing here doesn't mean we can preclude it. It just means that it right. might not make it rigid or apply to everything. Right. I'm fine with that. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm also fine with re removing that and adding back in the scale and rhythm. Thank you. I actually have a question about something related. Turn your microphone. I actually have a question about something related to this, but I, the design, but I don't think it's tonight. It's at a later time. OK. I'll, maybe I'll talk to you off. Perfect, well, I think. I think so. I, I think we've gotten all the direction we need to move forward with these three elements, so thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, everyone. So we're on to reports and announcements. So are there, city manager, do you have any reports and announcements? None at this time. Okay, city attorney, do you have any reports? No, you're just very happy to be here, yes. Okay, my fellow council members, who has, council member Lorraine, do you have anything? Well, I, I, I think this, you know, uh, I'll, I'll take this opportunity to just very briefly um, echo uh, what other uh, council members in the, in the deputy mayor mentioned earlier. Uh, in, in gratitude to our city clerk for managing us through um, uh, uh, a, a most unfortunate situation. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I would like to, to echo uh, the condemnation of, of hate speech. Um, and uh, I, I appreciate the efforts uh, made by our city to mitigate them tonight. And, and I appreciate our council uh, s staying with uh, the, 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 the work at hand, despite some of our time being wasted. Thank you. Council Member Hedges. And I wanna follow up on what Adam said, agree with him 100% and tell you how sorry I am to everybody on staff about the kind of stress that this kind of thing that's absolutely unnecessary puts on staff and what seems to be devolving in our society to a lack of respect for anything that's alive at some time. It's just so maddening to me. But anyway, I'm very sorry that you had to go through this and had to be put under that stress. And hopefully we can find a solution. I'm fearful, very fearful, because one, one city is actually already uh, expressed that they're going to cut off hybrid meetings. And that would be such a loss, especially to people with disabilities who have trouble getting here. I mean, this has opened up their ability to take part in the city. I would certainly hate to lose that because of these idiots. And I use that term sparingly. Thank you. Council Member Newsom. I don't know much about the weekend event, but I encourage everybody to come out for the pink badge event on Saturday. Does someone have that that they can, if you want right to there. give the details, Adam? <laughs> well, I can mention that it's 
presented by the San Mateo Police Officers Association. It's sponsored by and in partnership with quite a few folks that I, I, I won't, uh, I, I think it might not make sense to mention everybody, but suffice it to say, many, many fine establishments, organizations, businesses uh, are gonna be there. Time and, time and where? What time yes, and where? Yes, thank you. Uh, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Right uh, at the Pedestrian Mall, 100 South B Street, this Saturday, October 7th. All right, let's get out there. Thank you. I have no other announcements. Thank okay. you. I have no other announcements, but um, we would like to adjourn in the memory of Jerry Weiss, who passed away Thursday, the 14th of September. Jerry was a keen Kiwanian and cared greatly for this community. He believed in public service and offering opportunities to those less fortunate. It was the central value of his life. He worked tirelessly on behalf of others, leveraging his understanding of local city and county and state elected officials in order to affect change. He deeply felt the need to provide zedacha in accordance with his beliefs. I think we could use a lot more of that right now. He will be profoundly missed in this community. Thank you, Jerry, for your service. And with that, just one moment, Councilmember Hedges. I didn't know we were gonna bring Jerry up tonight. I wanna thank you very much. Jerry was a friend of mine. I spent a lot of time with him. Uh, we, served on, we served on Qantas together. He was the linchpin. He coordinated all the key uh, clubs in the, in, the, in, the, in the peninsula. And these are young people that are being directed toward community service. Thank you for adding that. And with that, we're going to say a few moments in his memory. And now I adjourn the meeting. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.